Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the uh, Monday, August 14th meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Would you please all stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening, everybody. The roll call from the town clerk, please. Chairman Garvin? Here. Councillor Grennan? Here. Councillor Caitlin Jordan? Here. Councillor Penelope Jordan? Here. Councillor Lennon? Here. Councillor Ray? Here. And Councillor Sullivan? Here. Um, as we start off with um, town council reports and correspondence, I'd like to take a moment of personal privilege as chair to um, make a few remarks at the outset of the meeting here. Um, the first is obviously we have a large uh, uh, gallery here today, so uh, I just want to remind everybody of uh, the rules of decorum for our meetings. Um, if you're planning to be recognized to speak on a matter, come forward to the podium, um, give your name and address or affiliation. Also, um, that no um, sort of outward signals of approval or disapproval for anybody's comments um, uh, are to be given. So that's number one. Just some housekeeping things. Um, number two is, um, you know, we find ourselves at this meeting um, with a few interesting items on the agenda, and I thought I would take a minute to um, try and explain some of those things for people that may have any confusion or um, uh, be lacking clarity about um, a few of those things. And so number one is um, item number 115 on the agenda, which is a motion to reconsider uh, an item that we voted on last month. So this is not something that happens very often, and as a result of that, I thought I would explain for folks exactly what that means. Um, so we're all going to get a little lesson in parliamentary procedure and Robert's rules tonight. So um, when uh, somebody on the council is uh, uh, votes in the affirmative or prevailing side of a matter, as was the case last month in particular uh, regard to this issue, they have the opportunity, um, if they were on the affirmative side of that vote, to come forward at the next regularly scheduled meeting and offer up a motion for reconsideration. There's a few things that happen when that, when that occurs. We'll take them step by step as we go through the agenda tonight, but um, first off is that the council will vote on whether or not to actually open up uh, for reconsideration that, that matter. And then when, if that does happen, it reverts back to the original motion from the previous month's meeting. Um, you may also notice item number 116 on our agenda, which effectively would be rendered moot depending on certain action that may or may not take place in the discussion and deliberation and disposition of item number 115. So um, just so that everybody's clear on, on what we're going to be doing, I wanted to make that clear at the outset. Um, the other thing I wanted to just talk about um, is um, more specifically to the process of, of what gets us to this unusual point of having a motion to reconsider. Um, you know, one of the things that this council does take very seriously is um, uh, the notion of serving our citizens well, good governance, effective leadership, and doing all of those things in an open and transparent manner. I think tonight's agenda is reflective of that. Um, I know that there's been a great deal of commentary and communication generated both amongst the community and directed specifically towards the council and even among the council. Um, about how we, you know, arrived at this point and, and with an agenda item like this tonight. Um, I want to absolutely affirm those things that I just said about this council's commitment to those objectives, okay? Um, there's been, I think, a lot of rhetoric that's been, um, you know, potentially um, mischaracterized about people's particular personal views or their motivations. Um, I can say I've been on this body for not quite two years yet. I don't really know many of my fellow counselors very well other than through our collective service uh, as members of the council. But I know um, in my heart that the people that are up here are doing their work with 
um, you know, clear objectives in mind of trying to do what they think is best for those people in our community. I think, again, tonight's agenda item reflects our collective willingness to um, revisit past decisions and make sure that we're, we're looking at things as the community as a whole. So I just wanted to put those things out there um, uh, as, as, as a, like I said, a matter of sort of personal privilege before we got the meeting going. That being said, I'm going to turn it over to any other counselors that have reports that they'd like to bring forward at this time. Councilor Penny Jordan. Yes. Um, I just want to remind people that the work of the comprehensive plan um, and um, if you go to the home page on um, Cape Elizabeth's website, you'll, you'll find under hot topics um, that to join in on online discussions. And each week you're going to see questions, and it's been really, really um, uh, good and engaging um, with many of the citizens. But it would be great if more and more people came, became involved in the, in the conversation. Um, and so if uh, you get a moment and you go on the Cape, you go on the Cape website, um, you can uh, join in, in the discussion. The next comp plan meeting is um, Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. And I know um, Maureen O'Mara is doing an update tonight on the comprehensive plan. So I'm looking forward to hearing that. But the more and more people who become engaged in this, the better the product will be. And um, you'll probably hear this from me every month from now until we produce that document. So um, if you would uh, take some time and um, go online, it would be great to have you involved in the conversation. Thank you. Any questions for Councilor Jordan? Other reports? Patty? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to let everybody know that our next ordinance committee meeting is tomorrow at 12 p.m. It will be held in the uh, Jordan Conference Room. And we will be continuing our conversation and work on the polystyrene, excuse me, styrene foam and plastic bag, um, solid waste ordinance amendments, as well as the domestic foul ordinance amendments. So. Thank you. Any questions for Councilor Grennan? Other reports? Correspondence? Seeing none. We'll go on to the Finance Committee report. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Jamie. <coughs> Uh, the council has uh, in front of them the dashboard for August 1st, 2017. It's also online on the town website. Um, we are in excellent, excellent shape. I want to point out a few particular items. We did receive uh, an additional $319,554 more from the state for general purpose aid to education. So as voted by the town council, that those funds are going directly to benefit uh, tax relief and so as a result of those extra funds I asked the town manager to develop a new pro forma for fiscal year 18 showing those changes and so you have that before you um, would you like to mention anything about that um, yeah. as far as the pro forma yeah. uh, sure uh, there's a couple of different areas that that are there at, uh, when, when the council last took a look at this uh, the net to taxes for the school side specifically uh, was greater than it is now. It's now at 3.3 percent. It was close to 3.9 percent before. Uh, so those these numbers on the pro forma reflect that due to that increased uh, uh, state aid to education. And, and the, if, I, the, if I could add, the mill rate was 18 dollars and eight cents. But as a result of those extra funds coming back from Augusta, the mill rate is now 18 dollars. 18 dollars. So per thousand. Yeah, so those the, that came together to uh, help off. Uh, the anticipated tax increase, as well as uh, growth in new uh, new construction in, within the community. Great. Uh, I'd also like to point out that we are uh, have been undergoing our annual municipal audit by the auditors Runyon, Kirsten, and Willette, and we are almost done, or they are almost done, I should say. And would you like to mention anything about that? I would love to. I, I'm pleased to report. Uh, Councilor Sullivan, that this year's audit report will be more boring than last year's audit report. <laughs> so uh, that is, uh, when, you, when you do what I do for a living, that is very good news. But they are on the home stretch with, uh, with finalizing this year's audit, and uh, they do think that this year's is even, looks even better than last year's. So uh, no, 
there'll be no management letter. So that's great news. So we're, we're on the home stretch. They should be completing their work by the end of the month and reporting out to us hopefully uh, uh, early in the fall. And then the council will be going through that uh, in, in great detail. One last item, um, when we met to discuss this month's dashboard, um, the town manager pointed out that our our overlay is very healthy right now at $390,000, and I, there's a little more detail to that if you please uh, give us. Sure, sure. Yeah, if, if one was to look at our overlay, uh, at the end of the year, uh, we were looking at just, well, just under $390,000, $388,000 was the overlay. But of that amount, uh, there are a couple of revenue items that come in at the at close to the end of the year. Uh, $285,000 of that is roughly homestead reimbursement that we receive from the state. Uh, they need to pay that back to us for their share of what the homestead exemption is. So that's a revenue item that comes in, as well as what we call uh, Betty reimbursement or business equipment tax exempt. Uh, when you have personal property that gets taxed, and uh, or it previously was taxed but has now been found to be exempt due to the changes in the law, the state has to reimburse us for that difference as well. So those two come together for the lion's share of that uh, amount of the overlay with uh, the difference between what we commit for taxes and what gets raised is just under $100,000 difference. So uh, some, some folks thought in the past, or the theory had been in the past, that the town might be overtaxing uh, because, of, uh, be, because of that difference. Uh, however, the real amount that we receive uh, due to taxes is, is, a, is a much closer number. But, uh, but it's a good number uh, to get to in that what is not spent by the end of the year or re, uh, that goes out due to uh, abatements and taxes goes to the, uh, what they call the undesignated surplus or uh, unassigned fund balance and it comes into the budget that way in subsequent years. Great, thank you. Thank you, just, that's, just that's one, all one, one last point if I could throw on that. With the town's value of just under $1.8 billion in value, uh, an overlay of that size is actually fairly, uh, fairly tight as well. So uh, the larger the value, the more there is at risk. So. Thank you, that's all I, all I have. Any questions for Council Sullivan? Thank you very much. At this point, we'll open up the floor for citizen opportunity for discussion of items that is not on the agenda. If there's anybody wishing to speak about something not on tonight's agenda, you have the opportunity to do so now. Come forward to the podium. Okay, seeing none. Matt, your town manager's monthly report, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm happy to report that this past month was an active month filled with some very positive developments. Uh, there were major infrastructure improvements being completed as well as beginning. There were grants for future pedestrian safety improvements secured, taxes committed, and other accomplishments. The major infrastructure improvements in town were the completion of the recycling center upgrades. This $1.4 million project began in April and is now up and fully operational. On August 3rd, a formal opening took place with several council members, recycling committee members, and solid waste and recycling long-range planning committee members in attendance. There are a couple of minor outstanding items to be completed, but the facility is now open and ready for use. If you came through the town center this evening, you noticed that there's a road improvement project taking place on Scott Dyer Road and Hill Way. That started after the Beach to Beacon, thank goodness. The work on Scott Dyer Road will consist of some sanitary sewer replacement, uh, new curbing, some miscellaneous drainage improvements, and Hill Way will experience more extensive work with full reconstruction of the road base, replacement of the sidewalk, and replacement of the water main. The Scott Dyer Road work is expected to be completed before school begins, but there will be disruptions in, ta in traffic along Hill Way as that work is more extensive. This is phase one of a two-phase project with an extensive reconstruction of Scott Dyer Road to Spurlink Road planned for 2019. The town was recently awarded a Portland Area Comprehensive Transit System grant for sidewalk construction along Route 77 from Pond Cove Shopping Center south to the Fowler Road intersection. This was part of a multi-municipality project and as we partnered with South Portland and with Portland. And uh, special consideration goes out to Maureen O'Mara for uh, spearheading that and working with those other two communities and seeing that through. The construction is planned for the year 2000, uh, sorry, 2020 with the local match funding partially provided by town center TIF revenues. Here's the good news. 
property tax bills will be in the mail this week. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, the new tax rate is $18, and this is $0.08 cents less than anticipated. Contributing to the lower than expected tax rate growth is growth in new value from new construction and additional revenue from the state for educational funding. Residents will also see an increase in their homestead exemption this year. Finally, the town offices will be closed this Thursday, and the day will be used to provide annual mandatory training in uh, safety, sexual harassment training, and video display training. These are all mandatory. After the morning programming, staff will go to the picnic shelter at Fort Williams for an employee appreciation luncheon, and we'll have the opportunity to thank employees and celebrate their milestones of employment. And finally, the uh, item that I just want to report to council is, annually the town makes donations to different social service agencies such as uh, Maine Health, uh, VNA, uh, Southern Maine Area Agency on Aging, and the Opportunity Alliance. And I've received thank you letters from all of them uh, over the past couple of weeks as the checks went out. And uh, it's great to see that. And they were all effusive in their, in their gratitude to the town for providing this funding that in turn provides a lot of services on the social service basis for, for residents as well as uh, people in the community. So thank you very much. That's all I have to say, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any questions for Matt? I want to pick up briefly on something you mentioned in passing, and that's uh, last Saturday's running of the Beach to Beacon. Um, I want to commend all those that were involved, either as participants, spectators, or most importantly, uh, our public safety workers, community services, uh, public works folks, everybody that's involved in putting on that race in this town. It's truly remarkable um, to see every year. And I've often said before, and we'll say again, that Cape Elizabeth never looks better than it does on the first Saturday in August, and that was true this year as well. So. Hearty congratulations to all that participated, and also a, a big round of thanks on behalf of the community for all those that made it happen. So thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll move into the rest of the agenda. First up, we have several presentations before we get into individual um, agenda items. The first is a speed and volume data collection study being presented to us. Um, and uh, this comes up as a result of a, a combination of both um, you know, regular look at some of the major arterial roads in, uh, in town and uh, to see what the speed and volume is on those, but as well as um, in the past couple of months we've had some uh, requests from citizens and neighbor individual neighborhoods to look at some individual roads as well. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Tony. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you all for uh, being here to listen to me talk. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, my name is Tony Grande. I'm the Director of Transportation Engineering for BHB here in Maine. Um, and we did conduct a uh, speed study, speed and volume, uh, at, at four locations. The actual study itself was actually conducted by Megan Ludlett, who could not be here tonight because she gave birth to a healthy baby boy two days ago. I gave her the day off. <laughs> so, uh, the town, as, as was mentioned, received input from several residents regarding um, some observed excessive speeds at uh, four locations in town Shore Road at Ocean View Road, Fowler Road at Fenway Road, Mitchell Road at Meadowview Lane, Broad Cove Road, uh, in the vicinity of 21 Broad Cove Road. And basically, the town went to PACS, which is the uh, regional transportation uh, group, and uh, requested funding, which uh, they did receive, uh, to do this study. So basically, it's a traffic data collection effort uh, for speed and volume data. So the four locations, uh, and, and again, I believe this study was available uh, online, right, so people could have. I'm just going to go through it quickly because I'm sure you have other things you'd like to discuss more. Uh, but we, when we were uh, coming up with these locations, uh, we tried to be as close as possible to the original uh, request location, but we also uh, did take into account the um, proximity to driveways or side roads, which would tend to have slower traffic in the mix. Uh, so we tried to get them on as much of a straightaway uh, as, as possible, but still in as close proximity as possible to where they were uh, requested. So our scope was to basically collect the speed and volume data at the four locations, and they're also, um, they also collected uh, vehicle classification data as well, um, which 
is in the uh, appendix if, if somebody wanted to look at that data. Uh, we collected data for seven days, June 15th to the 21st, using uh, automatic traffic recorders. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we tried to uh, minimize uh, possible skewed data uh, and replace them in as close proximity as we could to where they were asked for. Uh, some existing conditions, Shore Road, uh, the DOT classifieds roads uh, for funding, maintenance purposes, and uh, Shore Road is classified as a major urban collector. Uh, posted speed is 30 miles per hour, uh, one lane in each direction, uh, and the ATR was placed between Ocean View Road and Island View Road, and there's an existing sidewalk on the east side of the road. Fowler Road, uh, classified as a rural local road. Uh, again, it's 30 miles per hour, one lane in each direction, uh, and the ATR was placed just west of Fenway. Mitchell Road, uh, near Meadowview Lane, is classified as an urban local road. Uh, posted speed, again, 30 miles per hour. The first three roads were 30 miles per hour, the last location is 25. So one lane, again, in each direction, uh, and the ATR was placed just south of Meadowview. And then Bride Cove Road, uh, another rural local road, posted speed, 25 one lane in each direction, and uh, as close as possible to the uh, requested location. Just some quick terminology. Average speed, that's the sum of all the speeds that were recorded divided by the number of speed observations. 85th percentile speed, that's a number that is used in engineering. Um, 85th percentile speed indicates the speed at which 85% of the drivers feel comfortable driving at. It's typically higher than the average. Uh, pace speed is the speed uh, at the 10 mile per hour range that most vehicles were traveling at. And then ADT, average daily traffic, and, and we've kind of, we collected the data for seven days, but we used the Tuesday through Thursday uh, time slot as for doing all this analysis. Uh, peak, hour, peak hour volumes and midday peak hour volumes represent an average during those time periods. Um, the table is difficult to see, so I'm glad that I decided not to go with that. We did a summary of each road. So the average in 85th percentile speeds at Shore Road, 33 and 37 respectively, the average speed is approximately 3 miles per hour above the posted speed. Uh, and Shore Road carries approximately 7,000 vehicles a day. That's, that's the combined in, in, each, in both directions. Uh, and the peak hours carried between 395 and 630 vehicles per hour, again, during that peak hour. Uh, follow road, 35 miles per hour and 39 miles per hour for the average in 85th percentile. The average speed is approximately 5 miles per hour above the posted speed. Uh, and approximately 1,205 vehicles per day, again, combined both directions. Uh, and the peak hours carry between 85 and 105 vehicles per hour. Mitchell Road, 34 and 38 respectively for the average in the uh, 85th percentile, approximately four miles above the posted speed limit, uh, about 2,005 vehicles per day, and 140 to 185 vehicles per hour uh, for the peak. And then finally, Broad Cove Road, 28 and 32 respectively, Average speed is approximately three miles per hour above the posted speed of 25. Uh, during the, that study week, 1,835 vehicles per day. Uh, peak hours, 130 to 145. And again, this was the, the whole purpose of this study was to collect the data and provide that information to the town. Uh, so the average 24-hour speeds on all four of the study area roadways did not exceed the posted speed limit by more than five miles per hour. Uh, and the town also does have a uh, policy in place to, to address these. So uh, based on the town's traffic counting policy, suggests that Shore Road, Fowler Road, and Mitchell Road are not eligible for passive control measures. Uh, there could be some consideration in, on the Bright Cove Road, uh, but again, that would be something that the town would, would have discussions about. Uh, and, you know, basically we have done uh, what we were tasked to do for the study, but we're available to do more if, if needed. Uh, so, other than that, if there's any questions on that.
Thank you very much for the presentation. Other questions? Um, I have one either from Matt or I see Chief Williams in the back. Um, for Broad Cove Road where it's talking about um, the potential to review implementation for traffic calming measures, uh, just what is the process for that and, and how should that move forward well, uh, if that's the case? Yes, within the, within the traffic calming policy they set out specific passive control measures that can be there. One of them is, uh, is, is increased uh, monitoring by the, by the police department. Which I think we're doing. Which, which we are doing. <laughs> uh, second thing that we have done, actually just, uh, I, I would think maybe Saturday, possibly today, um, many Broad Cove residents received a letter from the town uh, just advising them that the average speed is about three miles per hour over and uh, thought the timing would be good now as we're wrapping up to the end of summer. Because uh, as, as you recall from the workshop with the residents, uh, the primary source of speeding within Broad Cove is Broad Cove residents. Uh, they're free to admit that, so I'm not throwing anybody under the bus. But, uh, but so we sent a letter to, the, to everyone who lives in Broad Cove this week, uh, so to, just reminding them uh, to be safe and to, to uh, you know stay stay within the speed limit. Uh, so that was another one of the, those are two of the three steps that are out there. Uh, there are other areas that we can go to further if, if it warrants, but uh, that's what we're taking for uh, for an approach right now. I did reach out to the there's. Uh, one resident on Shore Road who also had reached out to the council uh, numerous times as well as to the chief and uh, let him know, advise him of the data. I don't believe he could make it this evening, but I advise him of the uh, study's results and uh, to try to share the, share the news. I, I did want to take the opportunity to thank uh, Chief Williams, Captain Sinclair, and uh, Maureen O'Mara uh, for working on this project as well. And with Tony and with Megan, they did a, they did a great job on this to turn it around. And uh, again, uh, you know, morning reached out through PACS and at the end of the year there was grant funding available so by having a, th a thousand dollar match locally that the council approved we leveraged five thousand uh, dollars worth of work here to get this work done and you know luckily Tony's firm VHP was available and ready to roll and uh, they got the work done quickly so we could get the data there but uh, there is there are specific guidelines that are set out in the traffic common policy that we will follow when we do find it uh, as well as the Fowler Road segment is uh, is right on the borderline, as you can see. So we're looking at it in increased increased uh, monitoring by uh, by patrol as well over there. Great. Any other questions or comments about the presentation? Thank you again. Appreciate the work. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thanks, Tony. Uh, next up is uh, we have a presentation from the Fort Williams Park Foundation about proposed cliff walk improvements at Fort Williams Park. I invite Lynn Schaefer from the foundation to come forward. And while she's coming forward, while we're not decisioning anything specifically that I'm aware of for council action on this, I do want to let everybody know that my wife is on the board of the Fort Williams Foundation. So I wanted to make people aware of that. And like I said, I don't think that we're specifically taking action so much. It's just reviewing their recommendation here. But I think what they'd like to have is, uh, is approval by the council to go forward with their plan. Okay. If we are actually actioning something, then I would recommend repeating myself from, from this item. So we'll need a vote on that. We'll need a motion. Jessica? I move to accept the council chair's recusal from the uh, discussion on the proposed cliff walk improvement at Fort Williams Park by the Fort Williams Park uh, foundation. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Penny Jordan, all those in favor? Okay. Uh, in lieu of. Trying to get this to go to full screen. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Before um, the presentation starts, uh, we'd like to offer uh, members of the audience an opportunity to speak to the speed study that we just saw. Would anyone like to offer comments on the speed road study that we just saw? Would anyone like to come up to the podium? Okay. If you please queue up, and when you come to the podium, if you wouldn't mind stepping aside for a moment, thank you. <laughs> Please give us your name and address. Sure, my name is Matt Todaro. My address is 29 Broad Cove Road. Um, first, I'd like to thank the council for their continued effort um, at studying and analyzing this issue for allocating resources to do the speed study um, and for doing it as quickly as it, as it was done. Um, I think um, I made this clear at the workshop that we had in June. My position is um, unofficial chair of the Broad Cove Neighborhood Association's Traffic and Speed Committee. We've been looking at this issue for roughly two years or so, so that's why we certainly appreciate the effort that the town has put in. We certainly appreciate the effort um, in sending the letters to the neighborhood as well as doing the study because it seems like some of these things may be um, raising a level of awareness in the neighborhood. Um, the one item that I'd like to add tonight is that if the town continues, and we would urge the town to continue to look at the items and the options available for its traffic calming measures, specifically the, the passive traffic, traffic calming control measures, um, and, and we'd like to join you in that process if possible. So our proposal would be that a representative, one or two from the association, join you in analyzing the policy, looking at all the options um, that are available to the neighborhood, and then working with the town to, to, to put some of those in place. Um, and, and the final piece is that the Neighborhood Association uh, collects annual dues, and we've decided that this issue is something we'd like to allocate resources to. Um, so we, again, would like to work in partnership with the town to help allocate those resources to make the, the largest impact in the neighborhood to protect the safety of all the folks who live there. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Hello, uh, Chris Straw, 597 Shore Road. I live about a block north of where the sensor was on Shore Road. I just wanted to point out, uh, since it wasn't covered in the presentation, that the testing period for Shore Road encompassed the uh, Family Fun Day Parade. So in deciding the validity and what conclusions can be drawn from the data, keep in mind that the parade is included in what the average speed is for Shore Road, at least as part of the sensing. Thank you. Thank you. Chris, Chris. Chris, if I could, it, uh, the testing took place during the during the middle of the week. So it, it, he notes, um, if I recall correctly, I don't have the report in front of me. It started Wednesday afternoon and runs through until Tuesday evening, if I remember correctly. So he then drew a conclusion by taking just a handful of the days from the middle of the weekend, excluded the weekend days, but nevertheless also represented different average speeds. I'd ask the question as to are the average speeds based on all seven days or are they based just on the handful of days during the middle of the week? And also note that uh, being a Shore Road resident, I see the speed cars are going down Shore Road. And a lot of the speeding is from out-of-towners who are on their way to Fort Williams, often on the weekend. So yes, although for a traffic study, it might make sense to use Tuesday to Thursday as a general matter. There's a question as to with Shore Road, is it a unique situation given that we have Fort Williams at the end of it that many of these cars are traveling to, such that the test should include weekend studies. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we'll stop that and proceed with our Fort Williams Foundation presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Lynn Schaefer, president of Fort Williams Park Foundation and a Cape resident, live at 650 Shore Road. With me tonight is James McCain, who is the Arboretum Director for the Foundation. We are here to present and ask for approval of our next Arboretum site, Cliff Walk Landscape. Expecting that you have had a chance to review our materials and knowing that you have a very full agenda, I will move quickly with my remarks and let you ask questions when you want more information. The Fort Williams Park Foundation works to improve and sustain landscapes throughout the park in support of the objectives of the Fort Williams Park Master Plan through our Arboretum Project. 
key objectives of the project include reversing damage done by invasive plant species, restoring native plant communities, biodiversity, and wildlife habitat, improving open space, amenities, and access for visitors, and fostering educational resources, community participation, and stewardship. This first uh, image shows the Cliff Walk landscape area in green, which connects our first site, Cliffside, to our second site, Lighthouse View. It runs from the Cliff Walk uphill to Battery Mill. This gives a different view showing the dense vegetation rugged terrain of the two-acre site. Invasive plants are prolific, dominating beneficial vegetation, degrading wildlife habitat, and negatively impacting the succession of native plant communities. The ecological health of the cliff walk landscape depends upon the successful control of invasive plants. On this site, our methodology will be to gradually, over the course of several years, transform the landscape, disturbing the soils and beneficial vegetation as little as possible. We expect this to be a model for our approach to most future sites. Our plan for improvements is based on a landscape management plan developed for us by landscape architect Regina Leonard. Our approach will be a light-handed development of informal trails and destination areas to improve access, preserve view sheds, and offer more opportunities to appreciate the flora and fauna of this unique coastal site. The trail network is shown in yellow and green, um, starting at the lower end of the image, um, at the top of the steps above the lighthouse, and running along the uphill edge of Battery Knoll. The area in yellow is what we intend to or propose to develop this year. The area in green would wait until next year. The trail network will improve and expand existing social footpaths to help visitors explore the landscape safely and without damaging fragile new plantings or eroding steep slopes. The trail um, connects four different uh, viewpoints, destination areas. Currently, these exist informally as picnic areas and overlooks. This plan calls for maintaining their function and improving them as formal destination areas that are linked by a new secondary trail network, which I just pointed out. The fourth area, let's see if I can get a cursor on here, maybe not. Um, the fourth area is halfway up the slope towards the top of the trail network. Um, that's going to be new, offering a quiet respite under a spreading oak tree that we've already rescued from bittersweet, which was strangling it. This project offers great opportunities for environmental education and outreach to a broad and diverse audience. To accomplish this plan, we um, expect to install two interpretive panels, which you really can't see it on the projection, um, 
One is about midway along the cliff walk at the uphill side of the cliff walk. The other is along the new hiking trail that we're, we want to install. The interpretive panels will help visitors understand this multi-year effort at restoring the native landscape and the web of connections between animal species and their habitats. We will also install plant labels to identify native plants along the trails and in destination areas. And there are several slides here that I won't spend a lot of time on, but they show the construction techniques for the hiking trail, which is basically stone dust. Yeah. Over geotextile. Over geotextile to suppress weeds. Um, at points where there is water flow from Battery Knoll down over the cliff walk landscape, we will be installing um, special stone areas to keep keep uh, the landscape from running off. And where the path goes down to Oakdale, the new destination area, we'll have to install some stone steps. This gives you construction details and images of what they'll look like. And then these are some images that show our intentions. Um, the large boulder is the type of seating that we'd like to install at the heart overlook, probably three or four boulders. And the bottom right shows the kind of etching that we propose to put any place where people are going to come close to the drop-off. Of the Posa. Um, Again, more images of, of two more sites. Signage. Uh, we already have signs at Cliffside and at Lighthouse View. Those are larger than the signs we have proposed for um, Cliff Walk Landscape. Um, the signs that we propose there, if you've been to the children's garden, you've seen the interpretive panel there, 24 by 36 on a single post. That's what we're proposing for Cliff Walk Landscape. We also have an image there of some of our little um, plant identification labels. And finally, budget, which I don't expect anyone to be able to read from there, but the important points to make on the budget are, first, <coughs> that we have the cash in hand already to complete the tra trail network, the destination areas, and the signage. We also have money to complete restoration work, by which I mean the invasive plant control, seeding, and planting through 2017 and into 2018. And beyond that, for the following five years, uh, the numbers that you'll see in the budget are extremely conservative. With the work that we've started to do already, we're, we're expecting our numbers to come in <coughs> well below. But Whatever they are, work will not commence until we have money raised to pay for it. So with that, I welcome your questions. Or James, did you have anything I missed? Yeah, very well. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> are there any counselors that would like to uh, ask questions of either Mrs. Schaefer or Mr. McCain? Councilor Ray. Um, well, I can't read that there, but I can read it on my computer. So if I'm understanding your cash balance right now is $67,022, 
and your total plan 2017 expenses is 56969 I'm not sure what you're asking for for approval this evening. Is it for the 2017 expenses? Uh, the, the approval is for the entire project with the understanding that year to year we go before the Portland's Park Committee with our cash in hand and what we hope to do that year to fall within that cash. The first two years would be the uh, site improvements, the trails, and destination areas, and signage, for which we already have all the funds in place. So that we would seek approval for at the very least tonight so we can uh, schedule that work. The other work is all restoration, and that can be adjusted year to year according to progress on the ground and what funds we do have at the time. And uh, the understanding with the park committee we would go to them at least January or February and let them know what we've raised, what we hope to accomplish. And I'll hopefully not come back yearly to the town council. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I Normally when we have something like this, we will send it to a workshop for a more in-depth review. There was no narrative from the Fort Williams Committee or from Public Works that accompanied this. And so I was wondering if the town manager could let us know what has transpired to date regarding uh, the thoughts of the Fort Williams Park Committee as well as our Public Works Director. Sure, sure. And I, I know James and Lynn can correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I understand you made a full presentation in, at the Fort Williams Advisory Committee back in May, and uh, they they approved of your of your long-range plan as well as the short-term plan. And I, and I know Bob uh, Malley had uh, had raised the question the other day, and I forwarded over to James, and and he, and he threw Lynn uh, as far as financing and how how it was paid for. And, Said, oh yes, we've already reviewed that, and uh, and that was one question was about availability of funding, and I think uh, Mr. McCain and Ms. Schaefer just uh, have answered that as well as far as the ability to accomplish what their short-term goals may be. Um, are any other councils interested in a more in-depth view at a workshop? Of this is pretty uh, pretty comprehensive uh, list of changes. Any other thoughts on that? Council Brennan? The only thing I would say is that I, I feel like as long as it, they're collaborating with um, the committee and there's conversations going on and it makes sense and things are fully funded, to me it would seem like um, it's a very thoughtful report and um, I would you know, I would be okay with them going forward. So I, I mean, we could certainly go to workshop, but I um, I feel like there's already two groups kind of putting their heads together on this and if they are, if the committee's in support, I think I would be okay with it. Are there any, any other comments? Councilor Ray? Um, I, I'm not um, comfortable with approving anything beyond what uh, the total plan 2017 expenses are unless we um, look at that further because the implication is, is if the money is not raised, and I'm not saying it isn't, um, that the town is somehow uh, responsible. And so I'd be happy to make a motion to approve the planned 2017 expenses of 56,969 to look at the future plans at a later date. Um, mm -hmm. Not trying to be difficult, but I don't. Um, I'm not comfortable with uh, approving a plan when we're not not sure where the money's coming from. So, All right. any other thoughts along that line? I I would really be willing to support that. I'd be happy to support the 2017 plan as it is funded. There have been uh, concerns in the past that any project that we take on ha is fully funded. Um, so I'd, I'd be willing to approve the 2017 uh, uh, amount and then revisit, revisit next year the future plans, which I think are very exciting, but I think that's a prudent way to, to uh, proceed. Do you have, are you willing to make a motion? Yes, I'll make that motion. Okay, is there a second? Councilor Grennan, any other discussion? Councilor Jordan. I have a question procedurally. What agenda item do we put to this motion? I mean, it's, it's a presentation. It's not on the agenda. I'm just curious how that works because we have three presentations on our agenda tonight that I've never seen presentations before. And so I'm just wondering, I guess, <coughs> educate me how, how that works. Well, ultimately, on, on, on 
this is the only one that had an action item that actually came from it. The other two were, uh, well, the other presentations were more or less informative following up from Council's original actions. And uh, their desire to be placed on here was a presentation with the anticipated outcome of Council taking action. So as far as uh, being consistent, being able to act on it, you, you do have the ability yeah. to do that here at this point. So I guess why wasn't it an item number on the agenda? I guess I just wonder that, that's all. More or less trying to dovetail the two together at this point in time uh, okay. to looking at the rest of the agenda and seeing what we have for heavy lifting so at the that, other parts so of So my it. question then, what item number do we put, do okay. we just tag it on the end of the agenda number? I think we could, I think I can add, I can add That's it. That's why I was just curious how procedurally that would yeah. if we If we want to, we can add it to, and we could place a number as one. Sorry, I just made a number on there. Let's scroll down. <clears throat> 118. Uh, one, 21. 120. 121. Yeah, okay. I just okay. Yep. curious how that. I'm, I'm happy could. to withdraw if you don't feel that we should be voting on this. I think no, I'm just curious one. procedurally how yep. you vote on something that doesn't have a number. Yeah, we so. can, we can, Deb, if we can add that on, we'll have it identified as 121 on the minutes to identify it that way. I mean, I can understand why you're confused because it doesn't say to vote on. So, okay. Is there any other further item regarding suspending council rules to add? In the 121. Yes. So, could we have a motion to suspend council rules in order to add an additional agenda item? So moved. Second. Is there a second? Okay. Any more discussion? All right. All those in favor to suspend the rules to add an agenda item? Opposed? And it's unanimous. So now we have agenda item number? One, two, one. One, two, one. <coughs> so, Council Ray. Yes. Would you consider amending your original motion to identify it as an item number on the agenda? Sure. Um, I move that we uh, look at cut item 121. Uh, 2017. Am I supposed to do that and say what? If you would please. And um, approve uh, expenses for the Fort Williams Foundation of 56969 to finish their planned 2017 expense expenses for improvements. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Council Grennan. Any further discussion? All those in favor? It passes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So now, uh, Council Council Chair Carvin returns to his seat. Last up for presentations, we're going to get an update from uh, Town Planner Maureen O'Meara with an update on the status of the Comprehensive Planning Committee. Maureen? One minute, okay? Take all the time you need. I just would like you to, I would like um, to take a moment to just show everyone where we are with the town's website. So uh, it's just going to be a, a moment. Uh, we've submitted the first status report from the Comprehensive Plan Committee. The chair of the committee, uh, Tim Thompson, here is in the front row and has delegated the presentation to me. I uh, just want to let you know that the committee's been meeting since January. They've met one to two times a month. Uh, they've done a lot of that beginning work. They've looked at the state regs. They've uh, got a lot of tr uh, training on the Freedom of Information Act, Deb Lane, the town clerk came and attended the meeting and walked us through a lot of that information. Uh, we have started review of our second chapter, so the reason that's important is because uh, we've also hired a public participation consultant 
and a public opinion survey consultant. And our public participation consultant uh, has proposed and the committee has approved an online public forum. So I'm taking advantage of all the people in the room right now to make sure they know where that is. So if you go to the uh, town's website uh, and you, whatever format you're using, what you want to do is you want to look for something called Hot Topics. It's the Flames. And here's the Hot Topics. And if you click on the Comprehensive Plan 2019 without these annoying <laughs> updates, Well, anyway, you saw the flames. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. So we have the flames, we have the comprehensive plan, and it has a lot of information about the comprehensive plan. But the most important thing is this comprehensive plan form. So anyone here can go home and click on join group. You put in your first and your last name, and you can post comments. And we are putting questions on every two weeks or so. A half of the questions are asking you, what do you think of this chapter we've just written? So you can read the population chapter and you can post comments. You can read the brand new economy chapter, which is very much a draft, and you can post comments. And the Comprehensive Plan Committee is seeing those comments. Um, they're, they're asking you to keep providing the comments. They're still working on how they're going to collect all this stuff in the end. Uh, but the emphasis of this committee really is on public participation, so I would encourage everyone to join the group, um, follow the comments. If anybody gets stuck, they should call me at the town office. We're happy to help you navigate through this so that you have access. And I have no other comments unless there's questions from the council. Thank you, Maureen. Any questions? Thank you for the update. Appreciate it. Next up, we have the review of the draft minutes of both our July 10th regular meeting and our August 7th uh, special meeting and executive session. I'll look for a motion to approve the minutes of both of those meetings. So moved. Council Wendon, is there a second? Council mm -hmm. Sloan, any discussion? <coughs> Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Next up is item number 111-2017, Ocean House of Pizza Liquor License Renewal. Uh, council Chair, point of order. I wonder if the council would entertain, given the, the large number of people here, of taking one or two items out of order um, so that the public doesn't have to wait as long as they might be waiting if they're on a particular item. Would council be willing to entertain that? Is, are you making a motion to suspend the rules, or? I make a motion to suspend the rules in order to take, I presume, I would suggest not, um, items number 115, 116, out of order. Is there a second? Second. Councilor Wright, discussion? Council Lennon. I'm wondering if we should also put the agricultural easement amendment in there out of order, since I think there's probably a number of people here to speak on that as well. Other discussion? If we do 113 and 115. Is there other discussion? I just want to point out for, I know that this is a full agenda tonight, everybody. Um, and, you know, we walk a very delicate balance here of, uh, last month we had a meeting that went till 10 o'clock. We had to extend our we had to suspend the rules to extend business. And uh, there were a couple of people who on, you know, what I would say were matters of lesser importance wound up having to stay till almost 10 o'clock while we went through some of the media issues. So this month we tried to flip the agenda to have, um, you know, to dispense with some of the more cursory items. Um, so I, I just point out that I feel like we're kind of damned if we do and damned if we don't here. I totally respect the desire to accommodate everybody, but I also don't want to wind up again in the situation where somebody's sitting here till 10 o'clock for a smaller item. So that's my only two cents on that. Other discussion? Go ahead, Matt. Just as a point of uh, point of order as well, the uh, agricultural easement amendment is a public hearing, and the other is an action item on the agenda. So one has, uh, if you're looking at that clock preservation, 
One has a one has a time confinement of 15 minutes if, if the, under the council rules under the agenda item, whereas the public hearing doesn't have a time clock attached to it. And there's two separate areas, just as a consideration for council. That's all. Council Sullivan. I I appreciate that comment because that you know we do our public hearings are held under basically state law rules. However, given that there was a great deal of discussion in July related to what is now item 115, I suspect that we would be extending our 15-minute limit um, or considering that seriously. Right. Other discussion? Council Lennon? My sense is that there, I don't know, but it, I bet there are many fewer people on this agriculture. I think we could get that done. And, I don't know. I'm, I mean, I'll, I'm happy to do it anyway. I'm just saying I think that the, uh, my guess is that item number uh, 115 is going to have by far the most people wanting to speak. So I'm just trying to prioritize it in order of getting people out of here. But I'm flexible to do whatever. Councilor Jordan. Well, so with that line of thinking, then we should get just the proceed. fewer people out of here faster. So like, take it in order that Maybe we should just go in order and try to move right. relatively quickly. Is there any other discussion? Sort of agree with that. <laughs> we'll call the question. All those in favor of suspending the rules to take item 115 out of order? All those, uh, all those in favor of suspending the rules to take item number 115 out of order? Thank you. Is that three in favor? Did I see? Yeah. All those opposed? I'm set. Was the vote count five to two or four to four three? Four to three. You're, in, no. you're opposed? It was five to two. Yes, upon, okay. upon hearing okay. further reasoning, right. Right. I'm opposed. Go. Item number 111-2017, Ocean House of Pizza Liquor License Renewal. Is there anybody here from Ocean House Pizza that wishes to speak on this? Or anybody else from the public? Is there anybody here from Ocean House Pizza that wishes to speak, or anybody else from the public that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, Matt or Deb, have we received any concerns or complaints related to this request? I spoke with the chief. There have been no violations, and there have been no concerns or uh, other areas of concern raised with this renewal. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to uh, accept the application for renewal for the Malt and Venus Liquor License. At 337 Ocean House Road, CAJ Pizza, doing business as Ocean House Pizza. So moved. Council Caitlin Jordan, second. second. Council Penny Jordan, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great. Next up, we have a public hearing request for the Tower Overlay District at 19 Wells Road. I need to, as one of the owners of 19 Wells Road, I'll recuse myself. Would somebody like to make a motion to accept Councilor Penny Jordan's recusal? She's already recused. I think she's oh, fine from last. From last. Okay. Very well. So, um, for our public hearing, we'll uh, have a public comment period of 15 minutes. Uh, each speaker is uh, requested to keep their comments to three minutes. If you want to speak on this issue, please queue up behind the podium. Uh, when it's your turn, give your name, your address, or affiliation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the council, Mr. Manager. Need to close the public hearing. This is part of the public hearing. Oh. Go ahead. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, for the record, my name is Victor Manoogian. I'm with McLean Middleton Professional Association, um, representing Global Signal Acquisitions for LLC, uh, Crown Castle, um, for this uh, rezoning request. With me tonight, um, I have my team again um, from Crown Castle. I have Paul Peckins. James Bonamy, um, Steve Kennedy, who's our um, radio frequency uh, engineer, and Stephanie Jordan, who is our um, wetlands specialist. 
Um, as this body knows, uh, we started with this governing body uh, uh, sometime in January. Um, we went through the planning board. We had um, uh, several meetings with the planning board, which culminated with a 5-0 um, vote in favor on June 20th to recommend that this uh, be rezoned, and they sent it back to this body with uh, that vote. Um, subsequently, this body sent the uh, matter to the Ordinance Committee, and on July 20th, the Ordinance Committee uh, approved um, three to zero in favor. And um, we're here tonight asking you for your support um, for this uh, tower overlay district. And um, and just for the, and I don't have it. Oops. Sorry, one more time. So for the public, this is the tower overlay district that we're asking to be rezoned. It abuts the existing tower overlay district here. And um, what we're doing is putting up a new 180-foot uh, monopole in the new district and taking down our old, wider-looking, um, um, lattice-type tower in favor of a, of a thinner um, monopole. Um, and, um, through the planning board, we had some pointed discussions and suggestions, um, and we addressed their concerns, including making sure that the uh, roadway here in didn't in intrude into the 250 feet uh, from the RP1 buffer zone, so the roadway is going that way to and entering in here. Um, and we had good discussions, and again, we hope for your support. And I'll turn it over for Paul, to Paul Peckins for a quick summary of uh, where we are. Victor, thank you very much. As Victor said, my name is Paul Peckins. I'm with Crown Castle. I'm based out of our Richmond, Virginia office. Um, and let's see. Now, I'm assuming the large majority of you all have one of these. We use it in our everyday activities. Right? We call home, we check in, we text message our kids, and we go on Facebook to see pictures of our grandkids. This has turned into an everyday aspect of our lives. And what I want to touch on, and I'll touch on it very quickly, the three aspects of why this site is so important, what value Crown brings to the table, and the visual aspect. Again, why is this site is so important? 80% of all households have at least one mobile device. 48% of all households rely exclusively on their mobile phones. They've cut the cord. And this to me is the big one. 70% of all 911 calls originate from a wireless device. Now we looked earlier at the traffic count, 80,000 sites per day on this site, as well as it covers 1,000 households. So you can imagine the math associated with that. All right. When it comes to Crown Castle, what value do we add? We were founded in 1994. We're the nation's largest provider of shared wireless infrastructure, as well as we remain, maintain relationships with all of the key wireless providers, as well as all the upcoming emerging technologies. One of the things that you don't see behind the scenes is the non-tangibles. That's the maintaining of the, of the maintaining compliance of the site with state and federal regulations. And we do that through EPA, FAA, and FCC, as well as we have our own in-house team of legal counsel that are dedicated solely to compliance issues. When it comes to safety, we do yearly ground-based inspections, and we do tower inspections every three years per the national standards, and we do have an incident response and disaster recovery program. And what key, what's so key about that is that field operation technicians, construction managers, and engineers scattered throughout the country that can respond to an emergency or a situation at a moment's notice. And then finally, our NOC, our Network Operations Center. That's operated 24 hours a day with operators there. It monitors critical systems as well as emergency situations. It responds to network outages. And the big thing here is all calls are answered by an individual. So when you call and you talk to somebody, they know how to route your call. They know who to get it to. 
So it's not an answering machine, it's not a system, it's individuals that can make sure that those emergencies are dealt with in a timely fashion. Thanks. And then finally, the impact to the visual landscape. Here you can see how it sits today. This is the old infrastructure taken from the corner of the Jordan Farm. As Victor mentioned, our tower is the self-support right here. The guide tower is right next door. Under the new infrastructure, we're going to put a slim-wide monopole design. That's over here. And I'm going to flip, flip, quickly flip through these. So because I've got 31 of them, so I certainly don't want to occupy everybody's time with that. Yes, sir. All right. From Lighten Farm Road, it's not visible. From the golf course, it's not visible. From the wastewater treatment facility, this is what it looks like today. This is what it will look like with the new tower. Here's from Spur Wing Church. Again, very slightly visible here. And then when you put the new one in, it's covered by the trees. From Sawyer Road, looking north. Again, just over the treetops there. When you add the new one in, it's in the tree cover. From Pepper, Pepper Grass Road, not visible with the new tower. It does come in just right over the peak of that rooftop. From Tiger Lily Lane, not visible. Again, this, the new infrastructure is not visible, but you can barely see the balloon test. So we did want to put that in there just as a reference. And then finally, pictures from the site. If you look at this, this is the site looking north, south, east, west. And I think one of the key things that was brought up during the planning board meeting is that one of the neighbors spoke in favor of the application as the potential opportunity for the farm to remain as agricultural land use. And then as we mentioned several times before, this is the, the potential revenue source not affected by weather that can be on a, excuse me, on a portion of non-tillable land. And so with that, I'll open it up to any questions, either from the board or the council or from the audience. Super. Thank you very much. Councilor Jordan. And some of those pictures, it, it look like the old tower just got smaller, or is it just in the pictures? Does the old tower still remain somewhat? I, actually, the, the old tower will come down. Completely? Completely. Uh, just that's what, just in the image, I thought it looked like it still had. Well, you remember, there's two towers up there. There's a, a guide tower and our self-support tower. Okay. So the, the existing guide will stay. Our self-support will come down, and the monopole will be erected. Now there will be a period of about six months as we transition from the old self-support to the new, because you don't want to take everybody down off. Much appreciated. Just quick second question: Has anything happened? to the towers and the and with the carriers that are up there now. It just seems like in the last six months or so, coverage in Cape Elizabeth has been worse than usual. Mm -hmm. Just curious. Well, I got you standing here. Hey, you know what? I've got an RF engineer over there that I'm going to turn that one over to him. My name is Steve Kennedy. I reside at 15512 West Coolidge Street, Goodyear, Arizona. Uh, I'm a consultant for Crown Castle. Um, I'm a radio engineer by trade, 28 years in the industry. Um, the reason why it's gotten worse in the last six months is uh, summertime and spring and leaves. Leaves absorb a little bit of that energy and create a, a small hindrance that impacts. So the more, more trees you have in the area, when I live in North Carolina, yeah, wasn't wasn't cool, and sometimes service went down. But in wintertime, you'll see it come back just a little bit because the trees, the leaves from the trees, go away. We have trees every year. Just this year, the same. In this drought, the trees are producing more leaves. So the second part of that aspect is a capacity. So the more users that get on the system, the more usage of the system the amount of uh, throughput and coverage quality, not the actual coverage of the mm -hmm. site decreases, but the quality decreases. So how many people I can serve within that geographical area gets slightly it seems smaller. Like Ninety percent of households he says have it. So putting the new tower up is capacity going to increase? It depends upon the carrier's desire and what, what frequencies they're going to be using. I would um, I'm involved with other customers doing capacity increases like we're talking about where we're adding additional carriers, but 
for this market as the subscriber base increases and they start to show that we need to add some more radios, okay. they'll go ahead and start doing that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Any other questions? I just have a quick question. Um, so, when we looked at this for the ordinance committee, the assumption was based on what you had said that um, kind of our standard of cell service would be preserved as it is today with this new tower. That yes, ma'am. Okay. That was correct. That's the assumption that I need to hear again. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Anything else? Any other questions? Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on this? Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Thank you very much. With that, we'll go to item number 112-2017, the 19 Wells Road Tower Overlay District Zoning Map Amendment. Um, is there anybody that wishes to make a motion on either adopting the change to the zoning map or referring this item for action to next month's meeting? Councilor Jordan. I was just going to make a motion that we adopt the changes to the Tower Overlay Zoning, Tower Overlay District Zoning Map. Is there a second? Council Lennon, any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Great, thank you very much. Thank you all. Next up, another public hearing on the proposed amendment to section 19-7-2 open space zoning, section D open space design standards, agricultural easement amendment. As we just did, um, we'll have a 15 minute public hearing, a uh, 15 minute public comment period uh, with the public hearing. Folks are requested to keep their comments to approximately three minutes. Tell us your name and your address or affiliation if you want to speak on this. Please come up to the podium. I can't believe I'm the only one. <laughs> My name is Kira Wagoda. I live at 7 Fox Hill Road. I've lived here for 28 years almost. Um, I just returned from a recent vacation and I was trying to catch up with town issues. I was reading the Cape Courier over the weekend and I saw that there was this change being proposed uh, to the zoning ordinance that might have a long-term impact on our town's land use policies. I also read in the Courier a letter from one of you, Jessica Sullivan, about how town councilors need to ensure a proper and transparent government process. And because this amendment was just proposed in July, while many residents, like me, were away, and it was then voted on by the ordinance committee the next day with less than 24 hours notice to the public, um, it seemed like there wasn't really much opportunity for this to be discussed. And I know you're having a public hearing today with 15 minutes. Unlimited. It's what? Un a public hearing is with unlimited. Un unlimited, but you also have other issues. And so I would suggest you postpone a vote on this proposed amendment to allow more time for a pro proper and transparent government process to allow residents to weigh in on this change and to have a public discussion of the potential impact. The change is not just a clarification, it is a change of what the ordinance says. As someone who is trained as a lawyer, I am aware all too well of the limitations of words and of the necessity to carefully craft language so that you do not have unintended consequences. I think our community usually does a great job, a thorough job, studying an issue that before making any changes, and I think we should continue that tradition. My husband, Dan Sobel, is also in the audience here, and he shares my views, but will not be stepping up today. And I would like to thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. And Caitlin, thank you for the correction. The public hearing is not limited to 15 minutes. You are asked to keep your comments to three, though. <laughs> Hi, my name is Larry Stern. I've lived for the past 15 years at 1 Columbus Road. I'm not in the butter or even a nearby neighbor of the, uh, the uh, development that was uh, under consideration and sparked this, um, this ordinance, uh, uh, proposed ordinance change. My issue goes to process. I know that the uh, council cares very much about transparency and openness. And um, 
I was at the last meeting uh, of the discussion. I wasn't able to attend the ordinance committee which meeting, which was at noon the next day, and it's difficult for many working people to attend, but I was at the council meeting. And um, my concern is that one of the big motivations for rushing this was um, uh, that there was a potential lawsuit. The person who wrote a letter uh, that was um, construed as being something that was uh, perhaps a threat of a lawsuit got up and specifically said that was not a consideration at all. So my concern is that the lawsuit was used as a pretext to um, move something through. Um, it's awkward because there's a development under consideration that would be affected by it. And uh, I consider myself a literate person. I've looked over uh, the ordinance change uh, a number of times. I'm still confused about it. I wonder whether all of you really understand what this means and whether it's going to have any impact on the community. Um, if I was certain it wasn't, that would be one thing. But I don't think that most people here really know. And again, uh, my concern is about using uh, a lawsuit or a threatened lawsuit as a pretext for rushing something through. I think there's no reason to do that. I think there's plenty of uh, time to uh, consider this and make sure, absolutely sure, that this is not going to have an impact that uh, we don't know it right now. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jim Mora from Five Wombeck. Please send this zoning ordinance amendment back to the ordinance committee to allow proper public notice input with sufficient notification and an evening time. I understand how rushing this through quickly benefits the developer, but I don't, do not believe it is in the best interest of the majority of residents. I'd like to see the ordinance change have some sort of wording that would specify that open space is more useful to residents when it's when it allows, uh, when it is open to the public. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this? Hi, my name is Diana Stern. I live at 1 Columbus Road. And I want to repeat what you've just heard, that I think that this is being rushed through. It seems to be for the benefit of this development, Maxwell Woods. Otherwise, it, okay, I'm sorry. This, um, I just want to repeat that I think the council should delay this because I don't understand why we need to rush to this change. Um, th my understanding is that the uh, future open space preservation committee came to this language only because they spent a great deal of time discussing it and could not come to a definition, their own definition of farmland, what, what consists of farmland for open space. And so they defaulted to the state definition that is being used in the current ordinance. And I've heard no compelling reason for making this change right now. Um, again, unless it's just for the current development. And there's also no, um, the, 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 the change that will go through will, um, makes it so that the piece of land to be used as open space just needs to be part of a five acre farm somewhere. But there's no, there's no mention of what size that can be. Can that be one tenth of an acre as long as it belongs to a five acre farm? And it's also tied to the density bonus. So it just seems like there's just a, a, a lot of questions still. And uh, again, I, I have been looking at this, and I don't understand what the compelling need to make the change is right now. So I would urge a delay. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, my name is Becky Fernald, 313 Mitchell Road. Uh, and I just wanted to talk about the process for this amendment. Uh, this amendment was first came to a public hearing, uh, I believe June 20th for the planning board. Um, and this was uh, then brought to the town council on um, July 10th. 
and then less than 24 hours later to the ordinance committee. It seems like this is being rushed through, uh, that you received a, um, a letter, an open letter from uh, 111 citizens who signed it saying, please give this the proper consideration. It's very important to have an open, transparent process where community voices can be heard. And I do not see this happening. I think it's premature for you to be voting on this tonight. There are many, many unanswered questions. I was at the ordinance committee meeting. A lot of questions were raised. They were not uh, fully answered. There have been other questions raised since then. This is not a simple clarification as um, the planning board has put forward. This uh, has long-term consequences on land use planning in our town. It's. Um, uh, it has to do with land use policy decisions, and I think it really needs to be given the uh, very thoughtful and comprehensive attention uh, that any of our land use planning ordinances have been, have been given. We've had other ordinance changes that um, you know the, the planning board and the ordinance committee and town council workshops have given great deal of consideration to. This is a very very important ordinance change, and. Um, I'm, I'll speak for myself. I just I feel like citizens' uh, questions, um, my questions have not been fully answered. There's a lot more questions have come to light. Uh, please ask you to refer this uh, ordinance back to the appropriate committees. Um, I'm not against an ordinance change. I just think that as it stands now, it's not... Um, it's not sufficient, and there's a lot of qu and very important questions that could have um, a, a very lasting consequences on future development, um, and also on the tax burden of the town maintaining tiny plots of agricultural land forever. Um, that's the town's responsibility to maintain and oversee and enforce those. Um, if we truly believe in preserving uh, significant and viable farmland in our town. I think there's, um, there's much better ways to do that and we need as a community to come up with the best thinking. And rushing this through um, is not going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Anybody else wishing to speak on this item? <coughs> Seeing none, the public hearing is now closed. Move on to item number 113-2017, the agricultural easement amendment. Um, Patty, as ordinance chair, do you want to introduce this? Yes. So last month, the town council referred to the ordinance committee a review of the agricultural easement amendment. Um, as we had stated earlier at the last um, meeting, that was because of the planning board felt that the open space definition could potentially be interpreted and, um, and require that an agricultural easement must be a minimum of five acres, and they felt a clarification was necessary. Um, I think it's important to note that um, in our meeting, we also found that this amendment will not impact the design at all of the proposed Maxwell Woods projects, should that um, be you know, um, approved by planning board. So it, it was our um, feeling that we could bring this back to council. We can certainly have more dialogue about it, and I and I think I would like to you know ask Maureen to come up and and um, you did a nice job today, Maureen, answering um, you know so many questions and which we continue to go you know be asked and answered and asked and answered. So um, perhaps you can give us some clarification on kind of why now um, the need um, you know things like tied to density bonuses versus not. There's a lot of things that are that are out there. Okay, so yeah. I'm gonna, I'll answer as many as I remember, and just remind me what I forgot. Um, this, this particular amendment will not change the allowed density for the Maxwell Woods project. Uh, developer who's at the council's June meeting, I believe it was the June meeting, explicitly stated to you that uh, the reason they were proposing an agricultural easement over this land was because they were trying to work with a farmer and also to more closely align themselves with the current town policy that really elevates agricultural land preservation as very, very high on our list of goals. Uh, the developer's representative said that if you don't want them to make this an agricultural easement, they'll just make it a regular open space easement. So the question is before the council is you have an opportunity in front of you right now. And developers, like most of us, like to minimize their risk. 
and if there is any risk at all that this is going to trigger a lawsuit that the developer and the town has to pay to defend, they'll probably just go with a regular open space easement. And that's two acres of land that includes a cultivated farm field that is attached to an existing farm that's at least five acres in size, that's owned by a long-standing Cape Elizabeth farming family. That's an opportunity that will be lost. Now the council may decide that's okay. Uh, but I, I want to just recognize the memo that was sent to the planning board, from the planning board to the council, dated June 21st, where they identify this as being very ta time sensitive. The planning board has granted preliminary subdivision review of the Maxwell Woods project. Final subdivision review is going to start more than likely next month. That's one to two to three months, probably. So if the planning board grants an approval before you grant your decision on this. There's a very strong likelihood that the developer could say, I don't need the risk, I'll just make it an open space easement. So you've missed that opportunity. And that, that's what the time sensitivity of it is. The other point I want to make is, this was in the planning board memo from June 21st. The town has received documentation that legal action against the town is under consideration due to how agricultural land is defined in the ordinance. The planning board met with town attorney John Wall in executive session to receive legal advice and then discussed a possible amendment. So what the attorney basically said is that the planning board's interpretation is legitimate, that you can have a, an easement of a smaller size and it can come from a farm that's at least five acres in size. But he also said that you could probably interpret it another way. And even if the person who said they might consider legal action doesn't now says, no way will I ever do that, it's out there. Anyone now can step forward if the planning board moves ahead with the agricultural easement and challenge it. So the question for you is, do you really care about trying to promote the agricultural easements? Are you okay with the type of open space you always get? And, and I just want to point out that you know, this isn't like anyone can propose anything and the planning board accepts it. Anyone who's watched a planning board meeting knows they're a top group. And they expect things to be documented and they expect to protect the town's interests. So if someone wanted to give a tiny scrap of land um, they look at it hard. They're not the only ones that look at it hard. The Conservation Committee also looks at it hard. There's easement deeds that have to be approved by the Planning Board. They then come to the Council, and the Council has to review them. All of those deeds get reviewed by your town attorney, and you get legal advice on whether or not they're protecting the town's interests. So, I think I've covered most of the things. There is one other thing I want to point out that, you know, every single time, this has been discussed for three months which for an ordinance amendment is probably a short period of time. But it was discussed at the June planning board workshop. It was on the agenda. That agenda was posted to the website a week before the meeting. It was on the June regular meeting planning board meeting and they held a public hearing at that meeting. Members of the public spoke. So everybody knew about it. And then it was referred to the council. The ordinance committee knew it was coming. They put it on their agenda and that agenda was posted a week before the ordinance committee meeting. So there's been five meetings that the public was notified about, and I have emails and evidence of public participation in just about every single one of those meetings. So I understand that there's some concern about moving ahead with this, and it is up to the council. I'm going to stop now and see if there's anything I didn't answer. Questions for Maureen? Council Lennon? I just have a quick question. If we were to wait to actually vote on this till September 11th so that all these citizens' questions could be answered, the ones who are saying they don't feel like their questions have been answered, et cetera. Would that fit in the time frame needed to, for the developer to be able to use this and, and preserve that farmland? You know, in other words, what, what, yeah, when's I, the planning board meet? Would I that be in the deadline? I understand your concern. And, and let's, say, let's say on September 11th you vote to adopt this amendment. It takes effect October 11th. If the applicant submits at the end of this month, and my understanding is they've already delayed a month hoping that the council would take action, they will be on the September 19th planning board agenda. And if they do a decent job with their plans, they'll be deemed complete at the December 19th planning board meeting. 
And so the hope was that the amendment would be in effect before the planning board deemed the application complete in order to convey the greatest amount of legal certainty. So the answer is no, it wouldn't fit. It might. I, you know what, you don't even know until you get sued and you find out what the judge says. And so, again, you know, what we've been trying to do is to bolster the town's legal position as much as possible. Sorry, one more question. Why does it take 30 days if we were to vote on September 11th? Why doesn't it happen till October 11th? I believe that your charter requires that when you adopt an ordinance, it takes 30 days to take effect. Thanks. Other uh, questions for morning? Thank you. Other discussion? Or, I'm sorry, we, we don't have a motion yet. Okay. Thank you. Would you like a motion? Go ahead. I move that we approve the recommendation from the ordinance committee to adopt the amendment to the open space, zone, open space zoning section D open space design standards. Is that correct? Is there a second? I'll second that. Councilor Jordan, discussion. <clears throat> Any discussion? Um, Council. Yeah, I, I uh, would like to say that being very concerned about process as I am, I'm actually very comfortable with the situation because everything was properly noticed and put on agenda items. And as I mentioned at the last council meeting, that this this open space will be given regardless. It, there's no material change in the you know that will occur with the development whether or not this takes place. This is, as I view it, a win-win for the town. The town's policy for trying to preserve agricultural space is a very strong policy. Um, I think that this is, this is a very reasonable thing to do, and I, don't, I honestly don't see a downside for the town. Other discussion? Um, I, I pretty much echo your thoughts, Jessica. I especially, um, you know, was mindful of uh, the concern that was raised about the ordinance committee meeting last month and the timing of that. I think we had a pretty thorough explanation of that not only last month, but again here tonight. Um, secondarily, with full notice of a public hearing tonight, I didn't see anybody other than folks that we've already heard from on this matter. Um, so uh, I, th I think we had received an email from you on this, but yeah. Um, but um, I, I guess I'm, I, what, I'm, what I'm not understanding is the, where are the waves of people that are, that are coming to contest this that I, I haven't seen this part of the process. I'm not, I'm not sure if I'm missing something on that. Um, so. Any other discussion? Okay, seeing none. All those in favor of the motion on the floor to amend, uh, recommending the amendment to the zoning ordinance in order to clarify the existing provision that agricultural land may be preserved as part of an open space new development, section 19-7-2, open space zoning, section D, open space design standards. All those in favor? Opposed? motion passes. Next up, we have another public hearing, uh, this time on the proposed ordinance to prohibit retail marijuana establishments and social clubs. If you would like to speak on this issue, please come forward to the podium. Is there anybody wishing to speak on the public hearing for the proposed marijuana club ordinance changes? Seeing none, the public hearing is closed. Item number 114-2017, marijuana regulations. Patty, do you want to take this again? Yep, got it. Um, thank you, Jamie. So the town council referred to the ordinance committee a review of the recently adopted recreational marijuana referendum. In February, the town council adopted a moratorium on recreational marijuana uses, which will expire um, next month, so in September. The ordinance committee met six times to review, research, and discuss po possible marijuana uses in Cape Elizabeth. 
Last month, I provided, um, on behalf of the Ordinance Committee, um, a complete overview of the process we undertook and our evaluations of the categories of potential marijuana uses in Cape Elizabeth to include social clubs and retail sales, manufacturing and testing facilities, as well as man uh, marijuana growing and cultivation. So it is the Ordinance Committee's recommendation that the Council adopt a standalone marijuana ordinance that prohibits recreational marijuana cultivation, manufacturing, testing, retail sales, and social clubs. So I can make a motion at this point, Jamie, or if you would like um, some yep. council discussion beforehand. Yeah, please question. go ahead and make a motion. Okay, great. So I move to approve um, the Town of Cape Elizabeth Ordinance prohibiting retail marijuana establishments and retail marijuana social clubs. Is there a second? Councilor Ray, any discussion? I'll probably be the only one going on record that I really don't agree with this ordinance. I think that uh, it should be broken down in a different way, that there are different functions performed by businesses. I, I totally agree that I don't want uh, a social club or um, establishments of uh, retail sales. But I truly believe that people should be able to operate businesses where they uh, manufacture value-added products that may be able to be sold in other towns or in other places. I believe that people should be able to consider cultivation uh, for uh, wholesale. Um, and so I just want to go on record that I don't agree with the ordinance as written. Other discussion? Councilor Jordan? Oh, I was just going to say that it was a very difficult topic to go back and forth with. And I didn't agree with a lot of the things going forward, but it's very hard to draft regulations for some of these things with all the nuances that come with the state regulations. So we landed here in my opinion, I believe, as like a, we need to hold here for a while and see what happens. Mm -hmm. But I am more than open to re-examining this mm -hmm. as soon as anybody thinks they've got a better idea uh -huh. because we just couldn't come up with anything that was going to work with what we were given for state regulations. I think that what, what challenges me is that, um, and I'm when you say standalone ordinance, I'm, that says to me that what is being said in here cannot ripple into other ordinances. Because some of the language here talks about manufacturing. So what that says to me is that I cannot construct a large greenhouse on my property to produce hydroponic tomatoes that are very uh, nuanced in their, their growing. Because some of the things that are said in here really talk about it's very scientific. So a lot of uh, covered agriculture is scientific. And so what I don't want to see is a ripple effect mm -hmm. into other things such as um, producing a value-added product out of, I'm going to say, uh, barley, which I may want to grow on uh, property. Uh, there's there's things in here that if they ripple into other other parts other products could impact uh, agriculture. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if it was to the council's thought that maybe we could send this to another workshop and discuss it, and then perhaps we need to send it back to ordinance after we thought more thoroughly what some of the things Penny said. I, I think that if you can say a standalone ordinance does not ripple into other ordinances, if, I don't know if Maureen's still here, if you can say that, then um, okay. But I, I don't see where that is stated. Councilor Grunin. So I think we can call Maureen. It is my um, understanding that a separate ordinance would be easier to amend, and I, I believe that that's not the case, but Maureen, maybe you can... Um, just confirm that for us. You know, we have regulations that weave in and out of other ordinances, and the best example of the, the morass is Shoreland zoning as it weaves in and out of our zoning ordinance. And 
it was my recommendation that a standalone ordinance be adopted because it's most easily amended or replaced. Because remember, this is something that the state is still drafting its own rules. But we don't know where they're going to land. But this, is, this talks about specifically uh, marijuana. Yes. And so my question is, the elements within this ordinance, can it impact other large-scale production no. in Cape Elizabeth? This ordinance is explicitly covering just marijuana cultivation, manufacture, retail sales, social clubs, and testing. That is the only thing it covers. It doesn't cover anything else. No other product. And it's, and it's because it's so targeted to marijuana, it made sense to have it be its own standalone ordinance. Because, I mean, the, the, the ordinance committee discussed, you know, maybe you wait until the state gets its rules in place, maybe you see what a couple of other towns are going to do, and you go back and read this. <coughs> Go ahead, Matt. Just, just as an aside, in the different workshops that I know some council members went to as well as myself, one of the concerns with crafting an ordinance of this variety is uh, what do you define it as? And that's where uh, in other states that have legalized already, they're running into, into challenges where, well, I'm not, I'm not uh, doing retail marijuana. I'm doing process manufacturing of a product. And uh, so they skirted around the issue with that. Or I'm not doing process manufacturing marijuana. I'm doing agriculture and I'm growing marijuana. And so that's been one of those areas that's been a challenge, quite frankly. And that's probably one of the benefits of this ordinance as it sits now to buy the town uh, time within which maybe some of those uh, areas, those nuanced areas could be clarified and to go forward. So then this buys you some time. If you do want to go there, eventually things get defined better than maybe laws that come on board or other areas that, that may... If the state defines up. marijuana as an agricultural product, then you have the right to farm. And so that's what's happening in California and other states. And uh, so I think those are just things to stay apprised of. Yeah. Uh, so yes, watch what's going on, but I still think this is a very narrow, very narrow ordinance. Council Lennon? Um, I'm just confused how long we're extending it because it says at the bottom it's recommended the town council extend the marijuana moratorium to September 14th, 2017. That's like no time at all. I, I, I can give you an answer ahead. on that as well. Uh, doing the math on uh, looking <laughs> like at... Like by the time we get it fast, it'll be over. Do we mean 2018? No, what, uh, what we're looking at is there's two things that need to take place. One is you have the ordinance that you're looking at approving, but Today's August 14th, as uh, was spoken about earlier this evening, it takes 30 days for that ordinance to become law. So that would mean August 14th, September 14th, okay? okay. So the moratorium that was uh, put into place in, on March 12th, yes. if you do a little calculator, it says 180 days from March 12th results in September 8th. So you have that six day gap that exists between when your moratorium expires and when this ordinance would become law. So. That's why I provided the additional recommendation as an action for the council to, to consider, because outside of giving that six-day window when all heck could break, break loose. <laughs> but you're saying on the 14th, this ordinance will go into effect and will effectively be protected against all these things we're seeking to protect for how, for how long before we in, review this? In, until, until you revise until it. Until we want to come back to the table. Yeah. And, okay, great. Yeah, but it's just, it's just buying that six-day period Thank of you. time so you can keep your moratorium in place. Got so it. I somehow I missed that. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Patty, uh, point of clarification. Your original motion did not include language around the extension, correct? I did not. I thought okay. we were going to do those two separately. Okay. I thought just, we'd do I, one I, and then do the second yeah, one that's after. that's fine. I just wanted to double check. Okay. Other discussion? Yeah, sorry. Um, I just wanted to add that um, being on the ordinance committee, I was probably one of the last holdouts, <laughs> was I not? Um, growing up in the 70s, I didn't think we'd ever be talking about marijuana again, <laughs> but <laughs> having gone through uh, the uh, process in Augusta and all these other things, for me, the piece that was important to me was the smell. And we talked a lot about that. Um, 
living in um, a community where there were a lot of tight uh, neighborhoods and having some discussion um, with the police chief as well about some complaints about smell. Um, recognizing that we're doing nothing with medical marijuana because we cannot. Um, there's been some complaints about smell. And so um, it wasn't necessarily my first um, uh, idea, but I decided that smell was a big enough issue that I wanted to support this standalone um, um, uh, ordinance. And so I hear what you're saying, Penny, and I, our, I don't think our intent was to do anything with anything but marijuana at this point and then wait and see what the state did. You know, as we all know, sometimes that can take a while. And so we wanted to put this in place and then, you know, revisit it if we needed to based on whatever. And we received no input, zero input from citizens in the town about this. Um, we had many meetings, um, all posted, and we received no input. So I decided that I would support that. So just wanted to get that piece. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to adopt the ordinance um, recommended by the ordinance committee, a standalone marijuana ordinance that prohibits rec recreational marijuana cultivation, manufacture, testing, retail sales, and social clubs uh, to take effect September 14th, 2017. All those in favor? Opposed? Thank you. The motion passes. Patty, would you like to make a second motion? Sure. I move to extend the marijuana moratorium to September 14, 2017. Is there a second? Second. Council Lennon, any discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Thank you very much. All right. Next up. Thank you, everyone, for your patience. Item number 115-2017, reconsideration of item number 11, uh, item number 100-2017 from July 10th, 2017, Paper Street Technical Amendment Assess, Paper Street Technical Assessment. Council Jordan. Yes. Um, I do want to share with everybody um, that uh, first and foremost, um, I regret my July vote, and therefore I'm asking that uh, we bring the uh, motion forward from July 10th, item 100, 2017, uh, for reconsideration. Um, I say this for many reasons. First, the process was flawed. Uh, though technically legal, the council surprised July vote on paper streets did not give every councillor enough time to discuss, truly understand what was being proposed. It also did not let the wider public know that we contemplated doing anything other than receiving a report. It appeared that some members of the council were caught a bit off guard. In short, the process was not transparent, which is a council goal that we should always strive for. Second, on the merits of the issue, I believe that vacating the paper streets in question is actually counter to the goals of Cape Elizabeth to maintain open space areas for citizens and enjoy the vistas and character of the town. Taking away public land and public rights is not in the public's best interest. As one citizen wrote, paper streets are an extraordinarily valuable public asset. The public rights are irreplaceable once lost. Towns are about public benefit. Our town is desirable because we have worked to leverage the assets of our town. Fort Williams, Greenbelt Trails, Gullcrest, Shore Road Pathway are some examples. Another citizen wrote that the council failed to protect the public property rights of Cape Elizabeth citizens. Others stated that we were giving away assets valued at over $2 million. Many people mentioned the $10,000 feasibility study that we seem to put aside. The bottom line is I feel they were right. I recognize 
the angst of the abutters, but I believe we need to deal with paper streets and the decision around retaining those rights separately from our decisions around trails and greenbelt issues. These streets are public land and are open space for all people in shore acres. Um, now have legal access, and all citizens of Cape Elizabeth have the right to public land. I think there's confusion about ownership. I think there's confusion about many issues, and I am a person who strives to take issues and um, separate them and deal with them on an individual level. Um, I'm really cautious about trails. I think many of you know that I'm not a trail uh, proponent. Um, I, I don't believe in uh, people having trails close to their front yards. I do know that the Conservation Commission has no intention at this point of new trails on Surfside and uh, in the near term. This gives us an opportunity to maybe set some guidelines. And I believe strongly that if we all sat down together and developed those guidelines, we could put something together that works for everybody. I went to that July meeting wanting to discuss the need to separate two issues. As I stated previously, I believe in taking issues in pieces and addressing them separately. I feel that Vapor Streets um, and uh, that need, needed to be dealt with as one item and trails as another. Always talking about these two issues together creates confusion. And what I've talked to people over the last couple days and I've said I'm committed to taking each of those issues. We have to answer the questions and we have to put everything on paper and in the public. Um, I regret that I wasn't confident enough last month in my thoughts and my ideas to put them forth. And uh, that was a great learning. And it created a lot of angst for many people across the town. Um, so looking forward, this is what I believe we need to do next. We need to bring the motion um, to vacate back onto the table. We need to re-vote on that motion. I think we need to reference October 2016 where we voted to extend our rights for another 20 years. We then need to set a workshop and work with the Conservation Commission on their report and look at uh, what some of the challenges and issues might be. Um, I really believe strongly, and I'm sorry this is after, after the fact. Um, that that workshop is important in order for us to help resolve some of the challenges that are happening in Shore Acres. And I would like to be one of those people to help resolve some of the issues. Um, and with that, uh, we as a council, I think everybody needs to leave here tonight understanding exactly what the next steps are and exactly the role that uh, everybody can play in those steps. Um, and I want to thank everybody from the public who took the time to write and I read every single one of them. I may not have responded to your email, but I read every single one of them. And, um, and I understand the difference the different ideas, the different views, um, and yet I move to reconsider item 100 to 17 from the July 10th, um, 2017 council meeting relating to the motion of Cape Elizabeth's town council to move to take the necessary steps to vacate the following um, unaccepted ways. So. Uh, so also known as paper streets. So those locations are Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point Road. Thank you, Councilor Jordan. Um, I'll be looking for a second and reminding you. Please, the gallery will be in order. I'll be looking for a second, and I'm reminding everybody on what we're voting on so everybody's super clear here. I'm looking for a second on whether or not to re open up a vote on reconsideration 
This is not the vote on Caitlin's original motion. We are voting to decide whether to reconsider. Is there a second? Council Lennon. Discussion. Discussion. In October of 2016, three councilors voted not to extend the recipient rights to the town, to the paper streets and shore acres as well. At the same time, a request was made to look further into putting a trail on the three paper streets that were being talked about. Since day one of this issue being before us, the use of paper streets, the paper street Surfside Avenue has been tied to putting a green belt trail in Shore Acres. In July, when the report about the paper streets was returned from the Conservation Committee, I saw that it was placed on the agenda and called and asked the town attorney if he could advise me on how to draft language to proceed with vacating the streets. The attorney drafted language, and that language was distributed to all councillors Friday before the meeting. There has been a lot of accusations made in the last month about the lack of notice and transparency of the process. The issue relating to paper streets was on the agenda. I made a motion that dealt with the paper streets, a motion drafted by the town attorney, word for word. I will apologize that some view that this, is, that this as was not having been given notice. I did not see it that way when making the motion, but do apologize that it appeared that way to others. My belief at the time, just one month ago, was that the best way to accomplish not having a green belt trail developed in future years was to vacate the paper street, which is why I made the motion to begin that process. A process in itself that requires additional public notice and public hearings. I am in full support of Councillor Jordan's reconsideration of this vote in hopes that it moves the discussion through the process so that we can become better enlightened to new creative options. Thank you. Other discussion? Council Lennon? Um, I'd like to agree with both the Jordans um, and apologize for rushing the process. It was the wrong thing to do. I think we're, we've been made very, very aware of that. <laughs> um, and I just would like to urge everybody to please um, try to come together in a spirit of collaboration, cooperation, maybe a little less um, distrust and a little more assuming best intent. Um, I don't think any of us meant to um, cause the firestorm that we did <laughs> or to um, in any way sort of hijack the process. Um, we've learned a difficult lesson. And I really truly believe that if we can move forward from now um, in the spirit of problem solving together that we will come up with a great solution that um, maybe on some level a compromise, maybe not, but I, I truly believe that all parties will be happy enough. Um, and so please come to the table, please um, attend the, both the um, public hearing and the workshop next month. Please continue to email us, but email us with like creative solutions. You don't really need to yell at us anymore. I, I think we get it. Um, so <laughs> with that, I will be supporting um, Penny Jordan's motions and I look forward to um, a more productive and um, happy conversation that I think Cape Elizabeth is usually usually capable of and tends to do. So, with that. Other discussion? Yeah. Councilor Grennan. Okay, so I will echo all these um, same comments. Um, I think when um, when I supported beginning a process, I thought it was just that, a beginning a longer conversation and process. I, I thought that it was a legal okay motion because it came from the attorney. Um, so those were assumptions that I made based on, um, I mean, consistent with how I voted in the past. Um, I'm glad that um, we heard loud and clear from people and that to me, it feels like a public process, as difficult as it's been. Um, and look forward to slowing this way, way down, and really looking at things, um, pulling things apart, and really looking at what are some of the options. Some of the great things that did come forth is um, there were some new things that were shared that nobody had ever said before, and made us think differently. Um, and also, um, some things that, um, some suggestions that were new um, in this process. So I look forward to hopefully um, 
Uh, we will be rewinding this tape, starting over and moving this to a workshop and hoping that, um, again, that we can move forward with something that feels good for our community because um, that's, that's the only way um, that we deserve to move anything forward. Is there other discussion? Are there members of the public that wish to come forward to speak on this? Please. Where are we speaking the motion on the floor is to open up for reconsideration item number 100-2017. Uh, I think your question is a good one. We are um, primarily talking about process and procedure here. Okay. Um, uh, you're you're free to come forward and speak on the matter. I, I think that. By and large, um, we're, I don't think, looking to get into a free-ranging discussion about the substance of the matter so much as the process by which we go about this. Um, so I know that many of the public and probably some of you who are here tonight have shared a lot of those opinions, which, as you've heard these counselors say, we've, we've certainly heard. Um, but as a matter of the agenda and process here, what we're specifically speaking on is whether or not to open up the previous item from July for reconsideration. So if there's anybody that wishes to speak on that, please come forward. My name is Priscilla Armstrong. I live at 18 Avon Road, and I would like to thank the council for their action tonight. I think it always takes a lot of courage to say that perhaps a previous action was not the way to go. So I truly appreciate that your willingness to do this um, as a suggestion for the public hearing, I really would recommend that the two roads that are located in Shore Acres might be considered together and that the two lights, which I think has little different issues, might be wise to separate that out and look at that and its merits by itself. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, counselors. My name is, <clears throat> excuse me, Gail Krusek. I live at 8 Lighthouse Point Road. And just as the previous speaker said, here, talk about separation. I think that this could be much easier because we don't have um, the contention in our neighborhood. I, we have a neighborhood, a loose association, as it were, and we drafted a petition and gave it to the Conservation Committee back in December. And I'm not sure if it ever got to the counselors and we had asked that they do. Uh, we have over 100 signatures on it. One of my fellow uh, neighbors may have brought it with him tonight. But we have zero contention about the issue in our neighborhood and we don't have a vista at the end of our street. So if I could respectfully ask that perhaps you leave standing the petition to vacate Lighthouse Point Road Paper Street and leave that as a separate issue that's all I'm asking because you, it, it certainly, and you'll probably hear from some other people, not the contention you really have at your hand. Thank you. Greetings. Uh, Mitch Waxman, 9 Bayberry Lane. I'm a citizen. I'm also a member of the Conservation Committee, and I want to thank you for rethinking your vote. Um, on your charge, we put together a um, feasibility study on both of these items. And I appreciate that you're reconsidering it. Uh, I think the vote or the, the the report has the information that's really necessary to sort this out. Um, and I appreciate you taking another look at it. Thank you. Hello, I'm Jim Moore from Five Wombat Road. If the topic of vacating paper streets was put on the July 10th Town Council meeting agenda. I would have spoke about a letter to the town council a few years back from Jeffrey Monroe. This letter presented 283 signatures in support of a Greenbelt Trail on the Surfside Avenue Paper Street, which would require the town to accept this Paper Street. Paper Streets are a town-wide asset. Decisions on Paper Streets should be made based on benefit to the town as a whole. With this in mind, I looked at the petition from a few years back and found 84% of the 283 signatures were from outside the Shore Acres neighborhood. A recent petition you received requesting acceptance of Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point Paper Streets has 452 signatures, with 85% of the signatures outside the Shore Acres neighborhood. This shows town-wide support for accepting Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point 
paper streets. You'll put us at a crossroads. Your action on these paper streets will decide if we are a town that acts in the best interest of the majority of residents or a town that acts in the best interest of small special interest groups. You're deciding if we, have a we are a town that follows the American ideals of government by the people for the people, as Abe Lincoln once said. And every man is created equal, as Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence. Or a town that enables a few to benefit at the expense of the majority of town residents. Bring our town government back to government the majority of residents can trust again. Act in the collective best interest of residents by reversing course and accepting Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point paper streets. If you are not willing to act on the data in front of you, bring the issue to the voters in November. Thank you. Thank you. Please, please, please refrain from any signals of applause or approval. It is not within our rules. Please, please refrain from that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Nicole McCarthy. I live um, in Broad Cove neighborhood, and I can scrap most of what I had written down. Um, again, I would also really like to thank the council for recognizing um, those who made the mistake last month and the process that they took. And um, the um, two things I'd like to say, though, goes to por portion of what you said, Penelope, on one of the things I was going to speak to is they're two separate topics, the paper streets and the green belts, and people keep lumping them together. And I think it's very important that that topic, those two topics are separate, they're separate issues. And I think that really needs to be, moving forward, kept separate. Um, and I think that's where a lot of the problems come in to play. Um, the second point I would like to say is that a lot of people in Shore Acres feel like they're protected because they have deeded rights to that area. So even if the paper street gets vacated, that's okay. Well, talk to people in Broad Cove who have deeded rights to, to the access to the coast and how much money it costs them to go to court to protect their deeded rights. Your safest rights are when the town still protects them. So just a little word of wisdom from people in Broad Cove that spend a lot of money to keep their deeded rights. I just want to make a reminder for everybody that what we're talking about is the motion to reconsider. Exactly. Okay, so we're, we're and that's all you're going to get from me. My name is Paul Mosen. I live at 22 Trundy Road. Uh, I just want to support Penny Jordan's motion in hopes that this group will reconsider the vote of September and hopefully it'll be a good outcome today. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, it's Mitchell Lynch from uh, Lighthouse Point Road. Um, it, I, I'd like to just talk about the process. Actually, I was planning to talk about the process even before Penny spoke. Um, and our process, in terms of how things have played out over the last five years in Lighthouse Point Road, our, our paper street, we, it, it's worth going back. This trail that was defeated um, back about five years ago, Trail 29, uh, we've already kind of gone through this issue, and then the issue came back up because of the paper street. And the rationale for holding on to the paper street was that it was adjacent to the Coast Guard land and has potential uh, trail access for the neighborhood. Um, this is trail access that our entire neighborhood says, even if you built trails down there, there's no reason you would want to empty them out into Lighthouse Point Road where everyone in the entire neighborhood is dead set against it for the tourism issues that we're already facing. Um, then last October, the town decided to temporarily extend the town's rights to three paper streets while they conducted a feasibility study. Sounds like a reasonable process. However, the Conservation Committee, when they were focusing on uh, this process, they focused on could you build paper street. The whole issue in our neighborhood was not about whether you could build a paper street, but whether you should because of all of the other considerations, other practical considerations which were ignored. Um, although in the conclusion of the Conservation Committee's report, they said it doesn't make sense to have a paper street. I can actually quote, does not consider the Lighthouse paper street a suitable location for a trail due to strong opposition by the neighborhood, lack of future connectivity, and issues such as parking and access not to mention trespassing, security issues, all the issues with our kids where we have tons of people coming up on our lawns. So what they then go on to recommend um, to retain the paper street, which 
because, like I said, the Coast Guard land may change hands in the future. However, the town council, Jamie, you didn't ask the, them to uh, evaluate whether the paper street in itself was a, a suitable uh, trail. No one thought that was a suitable trail. It's a, it's, a, it's a small strip of land. It was always in the context of it connecting to the Coast Guard land. So it, it was a false premise, and that recommendation was a very strange recommendation. And the one issue I'd like to, to, to mention about the process, so this has been going on five years. We've sat through, I don't know how many discussions, same, same points over and over again. Um, our neighborhood is extremely weary from, from this whole process that, that just keeps on going. Um, and it, you can't divide the paper street and, and say, oh, we can say yes to the paper uh, street, but not the trail. It doesn't make sense. Anyway, I, I know I've done enough. I'll stop right there. Uh, good evening. My name is Mark Fleming. I live at uh, 54 Hunts Point Road. Uh, I am a member of the Conservation Committee, but I'm here just to speak as a private citizen. And I did want to touch just quickly on two points of process. Uh, the first being, I think in the discussions you've heard, I'm pretty sure it's, it's fairly obvious at this point that the Lighthouse uh, point, uh, that situation is entirely different from the Shore Acres. So I would recommend that going forward you really do separate those uh, two issues um, and both at the workshops if you choose to have them and going forward just because they are just two entirely different discussions. Uh, the other point I'd really like to applaud uh, Councilor Jordan for what she said. That was mainly what I was going to say tonight is just that the Paper Street issue and uh, the trail are really two separate issues. Um, even if you're totally against you know, the, uh, having a Greenbelt Trail there, I think if you look at the facts, I think you can really recognize that the vacation of the public street just poses all kinds of legal issues for residents. It uh, goes against um, and puts into jeopardy people that have deed to right access to those, uh, to those particular areas. So I really you know, applaud just the um, direction of just to separate those two issues. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Richard Bryant. I live at 55 Spurwink Avenue. Um, and I'm one of the people who wrote to the council and expressed my um, strong opposition to the vote last month to vacate the paper streets. And I urge you tonight um, to indeed, as you've indicated, uh, vote for reconsideration and reverse that vote. Um, I do want to say that one of the points I made in my letter to the council was that I, in talking about the strengths of Cape Elizabeth and why it's an attractive community, one of those things is the town government. Demonstrated tonight that you listen to the public, um, and I'm very encouraged by what I heard tonight. That moving forward, none of these issues will be solved easily, but I think with goodwill on all sides, that there is a solution out there someplace. Um, that being said, I just wanted to reiterate a couple points from my letter. One is that this really is a matter of weighing public benefits versus uh, individual private or better rights, and there's a balance to be made there. Um, I do think that it makes sense to segregate out the pilot point, excuse me, the uh, Lighthouse Point Road uh, process from the Surfside and Atlantic Place process. Um, but I do think it's really critical that um, you don't, as was suggested by one of the neighbors here, to uh, move forward with the vacating of uh, Lighthouse Point Road because, to my understanding at least, that is the sole means of potential public access to that Coast Guard property should that uh, come into the town's hands in the future. Again, that's something to be looked at later on. Um, and then the last thing I would point out is indeed the council really does have to be mindful of how its actions with respect to public rights affect private rights. Because the statute under which you might vacate the paper streets in this town essentially forces people who have needed private rights in those paper streets to file a notice in the Registry of Deeds within a year, and then within six months of filing that notice, forces them to go to court to prove and, and affirm their rights in the paper streets. So effectively, you might think you would be solving an issue by um, creating less opportunity for neighborhood divisiveness by vacating the public rights, but in fact, what you're doing is you're triggering necessarily a private litigation um, process, which I don't think would be conducive to either neighborhood harmony or a positive vision for the, for the town going forward. So thank you very much for what I've heard tonight. I appreciate it. Thank you.
If you could wait just one second. Um, folks are coming up on our 15 minutes here. Is there any objection to letting those that are in the queue continue? No, no, no objection. Is there anybody else wishing to speak on this? If you could get up and... <laughs> Thank you for the reminder. Good evening. I'm Nancy Marshall. I live at 10 Wildwood Drive. Um, as I wrote in my letter to the council, I am not a resident of Shore Acres, but I am a concerned citizen of Cape Elizabeth. And I totally support the motion on the floor. And I want to thank Councillor Jordan for her eloquent statement and all of you for the reconsideration. Thank you very much. And I will have more to say next time I have an opportunity. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Good evening. Thank you. My name is Mary Ann Lynch, and I live at Old Colony Lane. And Mostly, I did want to thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you for your service. Uh, as someone who's served on the council for a number of years, I, I know that it often seems thankless, and so I appreciate all the work that all of you do. Um, but I especially wanted to thank Penny Jordan, and I just wanted to say um, publicly that I am quite certain that in the number of years that I served on this council, I did not get it right every time the first time and I am uh, fairly certain although I haven't had a chance to go back to do the research that I probably voted on at least one if not more motions to reconsider so I think it's a tribute to all of you that you're listening to the town and I do appreciate that um, I did also want to just urge you that in addition to voting to reconsider to vote to reconsider your action last month, it's my view that you also have to vote tonight to retain the paper street. And after you do that, then you can have the conversations that you are talking about having um, with the Conservation Commission. But I'm concerned that if you don't take that vote to retain the paper street tonight, you're leaving some things in limbo um, and I'm sure that there are other lawyers more versed in real estate than me, because for me it would be about zero. But I do think you need to vote to retain the paper street tonight, and then you can go on and have your conversations with the Conservation Commission. So I would urge you to do that. And then if you will allow me one non-germane item, I would like to just mention that when I served on this council, we talked many times about getting this chamber air conditioned. And why we didn't do it, I don't know. Uh, but it seems as if every July, August, and September, every year, there are issues that bring a lot of people in this chamber. And I, for one, think it would be a very good use of our tax dollars. And so I will um, just make that pitch. And again, I thank you very much for your time and your work. Thank you. I do want to just jump in and respond to the point you raised on the procedural question. So when we voted last October um, on a number of the different paper streets, the uh, decisions were filed uh, with the Registry of Deeds. Um, and so the, the standing decision is to extend on these streets that are in question. The motion that was brought forward last month um, was technically not even to vacate, but rather the language being to begin the process, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So our, if we, in fact, do decide on whether or not to reconsider this, which we still need to do, and then move to reverting to the original motion from July 10th, there are a number of steps that I suspect may be taken of either amending or withdrawing or modifying that, that uh, motion altogether that will have no impact on the standing action that was taken in October to extend. So, go ahead. Thank you. My name is Jeff Monroe. I am a 38-year resident of 11 Katahdin Road in here in Cape Elizabeth. For those 38 years, I have traveled long distances and has always come home to Cape Elizabeth and have enjoyed a lot of good public access down on the waterfront by the nature of very kind and gentle uh, neighbors who always allowed that access, even though they fully understand uh, the rights that all of us had and all of us enjoyed. 
I've also been involved, as most of you know, in a great deal of public process, right? Working not only for the City of Portland, but also for the Massachusetts Port Authority before that. And I also recognize that oftentimes when decisions are made in haste or in misunderstanding, that there is a great deal of mistrust and hurt and pain that's left in the wake of all of that. On the other side, you always have to keep in mind that there is always an opportunity whenever these type of situations come up for people to come together and find good, meaningful compromises that work for everybody. It has been, in the last several years, a great deal of contention and hurt and pain, uh, certainly in our neighborhood, but I think in, in other places as well. But the reality in all of this is that your consideration of this shows that you are sensitive to the needs of the citizens that you represent. And that is the most critical message here. So I would urge this council to reconsider this, right? Put it into an extensive public process. 38 years I've seen this come up and go down again and come up and go down again. And you know what? A little bit extra time isn't going to hurt. But I think in the long run, it'll bring us to a point where we will come to understand each other's viewpoints and find that middle ground. The one thing I always fear with all of this is that whatever the council votes or wherever we tend to go, memories fade and these contentious issues continue to come up. All right, let's take an effort this time to think it through carefully and put it to bed forever. All right, and quite frankly, I think air condition is a lousy idea because meetings get longer when you have air condition. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, uh, thank you very much, Penny, uh, for this reconsideration uh, motion. And thanks to all of you for your comments. It really means a lot to me and I think, obviously, uh, the people in this room. Um, I just want folks to know, because a lot has been said about Shore Acres and Trendy Point, that um, we're just such a horrible neighborhood and it's so contentious. Actually, the truth is that the majority of us have joined together in a resolve to protect these rights for both the public and for the lot owners. There are just a few who don't feel that way and make it pretty miserable for the rest of us. And I hope that our town wouldn't support that. To the comment made by the nice uh, woman from Broad Cove about court issues, the council is well aware, but I don't know that the public is, that we had a false claim that the town had indeed vacated when they had not. And by the state statute, it doesn't matter whether it's a false claim or not, we had to, in 100 days, file in the registry we had to file a lawsuit because we're required to, not because we want to, we have to. And it cost collectively 28 neighbors represented the lot owners. It cost us over $40,000. So, um, so I just want you to know that a false claim put us in that situation. So if the town vacates, we'll be in that position and sadly, the public will lose this town asset. This belongs to the people of Cape. Um, and also, I just wanted to correct the record a little bit from the July 10th meeting. There was a counselor that mentioned that she thought that the, if there were a trail, if, if that does happen, some sort of trail, whatever that is, that it would be five to 10 feet from the front doors of the homes of the abutters. That would be mathematically impossible because the ocean side, um, Paper Street is at a minimum of 50 feet wide and it expands northeasterly to over 200 feet wide. And that boundary is not even close to those homes. So they're, they're not, five, the bound, their landward boundary isn't even, it's not five to 10 feet from the Paper Street. So that's impossible. And um, also the developer's intention is clearly stated in an affidavit in the Registry of Deeds in Book 6155, page 300, where C. Hall Baker states that the rights were given to the lot owners. So we will certainly, I think that Derwood Parkinson has given that to you, but we'll make sure it's in your hands. So the intention is already there. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. 
Hi, Maynard Murphy, 24 Pilot Point Road. Uh, I want to thank you for reconsidering. I hope you, that you do, and then I hope that you will please vote to accept Surfside and Atlantic Place Paper Streets. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I know you're over time. My name is Susan Johnston. I live at 2 Lighthouse Point Road. We're right on the corner of Lighthouse Point Road and Two Lights Terrace. And uh, this is a procedural question. Uh, can you separate the two tonight? Can you separate Lighthouse Point Road, the paper trail, from the others when you reconsider your vote? The consensus seems to be that uh, Lighthouse Point Road doesn't belong with the others. I don't know quite how they all got lumped together, but uh, everyone seems to feel our community is completely unanimous uh, about the trail. Um, there is no trail. It's Coast Guard property. It's a 60-foot strip of grass that goes nowhere. And it just um, leaves us all really hanging and worried about what's going to happen. And I, it just seems that there's a lot of strong feeling about Surfside and Trundy Point and these other places that doesn't exist in the Lighthouse Point Road. So is there a way that you can separate us out uh, with this vote that you're going to do now? That's my question. Thanks very much. I think you guys are tough and really doing a good job. Thank you. Tim Thompson, Pine Ridge Road, uh, number six Pine Ridge Road. I just want to take a quick second and just thank you all for your reconsideration tonight. Uh, it's, it's been kind of hard to, to read all this, the stories in the paper about this great town. And I'm hopeful that maybe we've got a newspaper man here. We'll, we'll be a, there'll be a great story tomorrow about how Cape was able to pull their town councilors together and, and get this right. It's really hard when you've got friends on. I've had calls on both sides of this issue, I'm sure, as many of you had. And uh, uh, they, they re really great, make some great art, uh, arguments on both sides. And, and so I think we get the process right. We should be able to come up with a solution. But uh, tonight, you've all made me very proud. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak on this item? Seeing none, the motion on the floor is to reconsider the July 10th, 2017, item number 100-2017. All those in favor? Opposed? Okay, so procedurally, we now return to item number 100-2017. To reiterate, a motion made by Caitlin Jordan to begin the process, take the necessary steps to vacate the unaccepted ways, also known as paper streets, pursuant to 23 MRS 3027, outlined as Surfside Avenue, Atlantic Place, and Lighthouse Point Road. So that is the current motion on the floor. Is there any discussion? I'm sorry. The, mo the motion right now that we're taking is to consider the request from Penny to reconsider that. And no. Nope. no, we That's, already did that. Okay, so now, I'm sorry, can you clarify are, what we're voting we for? Are Pretend that we're back at July 10th. Yeah, okay. So the original motion that Caitlin presented is what's on the floor for consideration. Wait, I thought we just nixed that. No, we have to, we, we brought it back on the table. This is the procedure that I was trying to explain in detail before. So we have voted to reconsider. Okay. Now we are reconsidering. Got it. So the original motion on the floor is Caitlin's from July. That's the motion that's before us. Do you have a question? Does the motion need to be voted, you know, a yay or nay right now, or can it be, can we the can, motion be taken off the floor if the, the person so wanted to? The motion can be withdrawn, it can be amended, it can be voted in the affirmative. It cannot, cannot be amended. No. cannot be amended, sorry. So it can just be withdrawn? Can, be withdrawn. can we just vote it down and start to, a new motion? I think it's motion. best to have a, you can withdraw it down and have, have a formal have a vote. Motion. No, you can just withdraw it. Well, wouldn't it just be cleaner to vote it down? You, need, and you need to have a formal. You need to have a formal vote because it's almost like uh, the house has been painted. Oh. So, in the sense, you can't you can't amend or change the color of the paint halfway through painting the house. So that's that shuts down the amended side of it, but then on the other side of it, 
Okay, so you need to act up or down so you can vote. You can on the, on the reconsideration, if you vote in a majority to to accept her motion and it prevails, then we're back to where we were July 10th. Okay. If you vote, uh, if the majority is not in support of the motion, then the the act of reconsideration has been completed and you unspun the uh, unspun okay. the wheel, so to speak. Okay. That's helpful. Okay. Right. So the original second to the motion also holds. So we're in discussion on the motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor of the July 10th motion, number 100-2017. All those in favor of that motion to take the to move to take the necessary steps to vacate. All those in favor. All those opposed. Okay. So we are back to then our original order of business, which was receipt of the report, Paper Street Technical Assessment, that was requested of the Conservation Committee. The original item on our July agenda was to receive that report. It had no further action. We can, at this point, make a motion to receive that report, refer it for further action. Those are the options before us. Is there a motion? Do we want to set it for a, a workshop? On that September 6th? Oh, cool. Let's do that. <laughs> and, and a public hearing? No, I move that uh, we confirm September 6, 2017 as the date for the Town Council workshop to discuss the Conservation Committee's report on potential trails on uh, paper streets in Shore Acres. Will you accept a friendly amendment to include receiving the report of the that committee we, as part of that? We received the report and set a workshop for September 6th. Thank you very much. Is there a second to that? Councilor Grennan, any discussion? Councilor Lennon. Did we want to put a public hearing on there for September 2? So, as I stated at the beginning of the meeting, item number 116 about a public hearing was sort of in the event that nothing that we just did happened. Oh. Um, there's so nothing to prevent us from setting a public hearing for the 11th. I, I think that, okay. in my opinion, what makes the most sense is to proceed Go to a workshop and then deliberately we'll to there. workshop. Yeah. It may be that there's second workshop needed or so on and so forth, but um, I don't think that there's a need at this point to set the hearing. Got it. There's nothing to prevent us from doing that, but other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to accept the report and refer it to a September 6th workshop for discussion. Yes, um, I seconded it. Yeah, yeah. Councilor Grenada. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Please, <laughs> ex-counselor. All those in favor. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for your comments. Can I and just have a point of oh. clarification here? Hold, hold on one second. Um, I just want to. I, my understanding, just based on what you said in response to Mary Ann Lynch's question, the October 5th vote to extend holds. Correct. Okay. 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 I just want everybody to understand exactly where yep. we're at. Okay. If you're not interested in anything else on the agenda, please feel free to exit. Just one second. If you could do so quickly and quietly, that would be great. We still have a few other items. It will be posted. It's, they're typically at 7 o'clock, but I would suspect 7 o'clock on the 6th. So. We still have a couple of other agenda items. Please, if you could take your conversations outside the hall. Next item up on the agenda is item number 117-2017, Maine Municipal Association voting ballot. Matt, do you want to introduce us? Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to. Uh, what you have on this agenda item is uh, Maine Municipal Association has an election annually, and then that... Hold on. <coughs> Please, we're still continuing with the meeting. If you could take your conversation outside, thank you. And uh, uh, on 
that on that ballot it provides uh, candidates for vice president as well as for executive board. Uh, they've nominated for uh, vice president for one year term uh, Mary Sabins, who is the town manager of Vassalboro. And then there are three uh, exec board candidates: Jim Bennett from uh, the city of he's the city manager for Biddeford, Jill Dusen, who is a at large counselor for Portland, and Gary Fortier, who is a counselor for the city of Ellsworth. Uh, if you would like to nominate somebody else, you would have that ability to, if you'd like, at this point. But generally, it's uh, they send the slate of candidates forward for councils to act upon, and uh, I can sign this and send it in the mail tomorrow if the council so chooses to uh, endorse these candidates uh, for the town's vote. Thank you, Matt. Is there a motion to approve the recommended candidates for MMA uh, voting as proposed? Councilor Sullivan. I so move. Is there a second? Councilor Penny Jordan. Any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor? Great. Thank you. Next up is item number 118-2017, uh, workshop with the Fort Williams Park Committee. Um, I'll introduce this. Um, as you'll remember, I think I gave it an update either at the July meeting or yeah, I think it was the July meeting. Um, Matt and I and the chair of the Fort Williams Committee held a, a get-together um, in either late June or early July. Um, one of our council goals is to have a further and thorough discussion about some of the long-range issues confronting Fort Williams. This is intended to be one of the first steps to that process. Um, so uh, we're recommending that in addition to the workshop that we already have scheduled for the 6th, we have a separate workshop on the 18th, uh, joining with the Fort Williams Park Committee. So I'll look for a motion to uh, set that workshop date. Council Lennon? I move that we set a workshop for September 18th at 7 p.m. Um, to talk with the Fort Williams Park Committee on the many issues facing Fort Williams. Thank you very much. Is there a second? Council Grennan, any discussion? Council Ray? Yeah, um, is this also the workshop that we're going to have that we've talked about for a number for quite quite a while to talk about um, the relationship between the Fort Williams Committee and the town council because I think that was one of our goals at one point um, we talked about that um, you know we made some changes um, it used to be um, the Fort Williams Park Else. Because the advisory commission, commission. and the commission. committee. Yeah. Yes, and there were some changes made, and I know that there was some discussion about that relationship. And so we were at one point going to have a meeting to discuss that. And is that sort of part of all of this, or? I think my my interpretation would be based on the discussion of the meeting I was in. Matt, feel free to weigh in. Is that that is among the many issues? There's operational issues in the park. There's long-range planning issues for the park. There's um, you know, uh, overall, um, to use the term advisory components. So yes, right, right. I think, and I, I don't think I'll, I'll be perfect. I mean, I don't think all of this is going to be solved. No, in probably one not. Day, so. I just want to make sure that yeah. that's on the laundry list of things to discuss. Relationship to the Fort Williams Park Foundation, etc. I mean, these are all all things that are will be included in the agenda. And I think you're looking at goal, trying to find goal alignment between the council and the committee as well, and uh, trying to identify many of the different concerns that that both have. And because uh, ultimately, it's the you know the council is the is the driver, and uh, work right. with the committee as far as the implementer where where it goes. So, uh, but they have some on the ground experience that they can bring back to council. And uh, it was a very productive meeting with the uh, with the chairmen and, uh, and and Bob Malley and I myself and. Uh, but I think that's a good step in, the, you know, in trying to find a date all summer to have that come. And September was the date we were looking at, but then uh, let's just say September uh, calendar became complicated. So that's why we're looking at the 18th. I don't care about the date. I just want to make sure that that's you know part of the list because it's been an issue in the past, and I want to make sure that we're able to have that open discussion about relationship between the committee and the council. Thanks. Understood. Other discussion? And then all those in favor of setting the September 18th workshop for a discussion with the Fort Williams Park Committee. Great, thank you very much. Next up is item number 119-2017, reauthorization of the Spur Ring School Reuse Committee. I'll again introduce this. So um, as again, you've heard me provide an update. Um, the 
work of the long ago but not forgotten committee for the Spur Week School <laughs> reuse uh, remains unsettled and unfinished. Um, I did have a meeting uh, last month with um, the manager as well as the new facilities director. So uh, among the many things that um, you know slowed down this process um, was Greg Marl's departure as facilities director. He was serving as staff liaison as well as um, you know a key sort of vested interest in our uh, ongoing evaluation of how to best use, reuse the Spur Week School. So um, Perry Schwartz has started uh, in that role and Matt and I met with him, had a chance to take him over to the property, um, have some conversation to bring him up to speed on where we stand with this. So it's my request that we reauthorize and, and uh, effectively reactivate the committee through the end of this calendar year in order to finalize a report and recommendations um, for the facility to provide back to this, this uh, council. So I'll look for a motion to that point. Council Sullivan? So moved. Any second? Second. Council Jordan? Thank you. Any discussion? Getting the band back together, Kate. I, know, I, was, like, I was just like counting. Can we get I see that John, John Volts and Jim Walsh left before we had this action, though. I was ready to <laughs> sign the vote. So That's Jim right. Walsh. So, all right. All those in favor? Great. Thank you very much. Um, given the hour, um, we have next on our agenda item number 120-2017, town manager evaluation. Uh, our plan was to entertain a motion to move into executive session to continue our discussion on that. I am open to counselors' discussion on whether or not we feel that that's something we want to do at this hour. I know that we're not bound by the same rules of 10 o'clock as it pertains to executive session, but um, I'll entertain discussion on that. Councilor Sullivan. Yeah, I think uh, it's been a long evening. We're all very hot and probably tired. And I think that it would be prudent to consider rescheduling the town manager's evaluation because it deserves our best attention. And I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm capable of that this evening. <laughs> so I'm, I'm certainly in favor of considering rescheduling. But whatever the will of the council is. Other discussion? I agree. I agree with Jessica. I think it seems, uh, seems unanimous. Time that it needs. Yeah. Um, so, as a matter of procedure, um, I think we need to, because if we table this, it doesn't come up until the next scheduled meeting. So, I think we need to alter the motion to, to actually reschedule and set the date. Yeah. So, um, do, we have, do we have to have a date? Maybe best to have that. Uh, table to a date to a date certain would be good unless you if you want to do something between now and the next council meeting you probably should identify that that date at that one time. Could we do it prior to our September sixth workshop? I think that's gonna be a long night. That's gonna be a long night. I think. Wait. Are you saying in order to make this legitimate, we have to know? If we simply because you could email around and we could find yeah. a good thing. Yeah. So here's the here's the problem we're boxed in on procedurally. If we simply table this motion then it automatically gets punted to the next regular council meeting, which is not until September. Well, why can't we just vote now on the motion? <laughs> yeah. Knowing that we're well, going to tomorrow no, schedule. Nobody's them. introduced it. Um, we can all just introduce it, vote now, and then tomorrow we'll find a, day, a night that we can all meet. Like and set up an um, executive session workshop. There's no. I mean, there's a motion. We just vote now, and then we can do it. You know, we like, can just take no action on it. Well, you just vote no to not, like Sarah said, not go into executive session. Not go into executive session. Okay. That's and then the we'll just find a time we can go meet at six. Why don't we do this? Why don't we let the record reflect that we're taking, based on the hour, we're taking no action on this on this scheduled agenda item, mm -hmm. and then we'll, we will reschedule it for a separate I think that's clear. meeting. Just a clarification on the rules. Can you do that if it's before 10 o'clock? You can do it every morning. I think you're safe. Okay. I think you're safe, and I don't, I don't uh, with the record show, I don't object. <laughs> so I think part of that is, uh, is not to get too wonky, but as far as, uh, you know, you need a willing dance partner, and I'm more than willing dance partner uh, based on the hour and the evening and so on and so forth. So if you want, if the council can find a date that works for everybody, and uh, I'm willing to, and we can, and, you know, and Devin, I can find the opportunity to post it and make sure we get advance notice. So. 
so the public knows that the council will be getting together for that specific purpose, then uh, I'm, I'm okay with making that happen as well. Okay. That will work with you on finding the. Mm -hmm. uh, that brings us to the conclusion of the regular agenda. Uh, is there anybody still remaining that wishes to come forward to speak on anything not on tonight's agenda? Now's your opportunity. Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? No move. Councilor Caitlin Jordan, second. Councilor Lennon, all those in favor? Great. Have a good night. <laughs>